This episode brought to you by How to Write Manga, your complete guide to the secrets of Japanese comic book storytelling. Available wherever fine ebooks are sold. The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci fi subjugates the movies. And fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, operatives, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. Hi, Hen Kowaiyo. And tonight, folks, we're going to be talking about manga. Specifically, those weird Japanese comics with those big friggin' eyes and those, like, tiny noses that just kind of freak some people out and look kind of like the children of alien greys. You know, those (laughs) things. Manga. (laughs) <laughs> the Japanese comic phenomenon that has swept the world over the last two decades. I mean, the Japanese do make more comics than anyone else on the planet, so we should probably talk about them at some point. And Don and I decided that this would be a good opportunity to talk about the history of manga and kind of do a backgrounder show on the whole manga thing. <laughs> I can't call it a genre because it's not a genre. It's kind of just its own medium sort of thingy. How would you describe it, Don? Um. Well, this was something... Um to any of the listeners at home, I think we should give a couple disclaimers right off the bat. Yes, we should. One is we're going to be going through literally about 400 years worth of history in an hour or two. Um, So you're going Mm -hmm. to be getting, you're getting a really condensed version. Yes, you are. I think it's a good, it's good though, because um, the topic is a Japanese comics. That'd be like uh, the example I always use is that's like saying television here. It, Mm. It covers a lot of ground. You kind of have to have some kind of framework just to jump in. And I think that's what we're going to, we're going to give you here today. Yes. I would say that's the intent. Another disclaimer that I'd like to add is that, um, Don and I are both, um, male. And, um, as an end result of that, we're probably going to be skewed towards like basically the boys comic stuff the boys and men's comic stuff this isn't because that there aren't some awesome girls comics out there it's just because that's not what we normally read so if you're expecting to get the history of shoujo comics tonight you're probably going to be disappointed we will reference them we will mention them because of course they're they are important but they're not something that we're going to be focusing too much on in detail anyway yeah and that that goes with the idea too if you're talking about something all-encompassing you have to sort of find your in Mm, true um you also kind of hit at another interesting thing that's going to come up and might confuse people is um the idea of how genres work for for japanese comics especially Mm. um uh, there it's good to consider what would be a genre and a style right how would you define them differently don Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it, and this is, again, something that's probably going to pop up a fair amount during this episode. I'm, I'll compare it to how things work here in, like, mm-hmm. North America. We have comic books, and we have, like, say, um, historically, it'd be, like, funny animal comics, like mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny. Um, you'd have superhero comics. You'd have science fiction comics. And each of those would be its own genre. So if you picked up a superhero comic book, depending on the era, mm-hmm. there would there would be a certain way it's done... A uh, certain look, certain kinds of story, certain way characters would be done, and that would be a superhero thing. Hmm. Japan, because there's so much volume, it gets split up a little bit more. So we've already mentioned like uh, shojo and shonen comics. Shonen comics are probably closer to what we think of here because it's boys' action. Mm-hmm. But whereas here, a boys' action book would be something very specific. You're talking about like your 60s or 70s like kind of adventure comics Mm -hmm. in japan you can do like a a a shonen soap opera or sci-fi story or action story or sports drama which is something we don't have here anymore or 
geez, you could do like a a, a shonen comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's a certain style, a certain kind of pacing, a certain kind of design, a certain kind of artwork, a certain kind of layout. But mm. you can use it to tell different kinds of stories. And that's something we tend not to do here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there are shoujo styles, shonen styles, seinen styles. There are a couple others, too. And each of them would put a completely different spin on the exact same story. They would yeah. look different. They would feel different because they're targeted towards a different audience. That's the key. Yeah. And that audience has different expectations and is looking for different things. And so, therefore, the style can radically alter the same story of the same genre, depending yeah. on what who the audience is and what you're presenting to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, That's a good it's point. A, yeah, because we don't – the closest we'll get here is you can do um, – like, say, if I do an action movie or a horror movie, I can do a comedy horror movie or a comedy action movie. But you don't generally see, um, like, a horror soap opera. Not since Dark Shadows, anyway. Actually, there's been a couple of uh, low-budget movies in, like, the 90s and that. And in some ways, that's what Twilight's supposed to be, too. But if you You're right, see, it like, is. this. Hmm. Hmm. But it's not something that we generally do very often we tend not to mix our genres as much well if that's the case if it's twilight then shows like the vampire diaries on like the cw and that would actually be horror soap operas wouldn't they they are because they're all basically just twilight yeah but that was something you generally we didn't do hmm. for for like decades really until yeah. that one thing hit and then that became the new formula and mm. then it became its own thing that's true Okay, I see your point. I see your yeah, point. We, we tend to very, very, very clearly define stuff here. Yes. And the Japanese have a lot more mixing going on. And yeah. this is one of the other things, actually, that we should probably bring up. So the Japanese, by virtue of being the largest comic market in the world and the sheer amount of material they produce, which we'll get to later, you have to understand <laughs> that it's kind of like a tree with like a million branches. So I'm going to be starting out by doing the history of manga in a lot of ways, by which I mean the history to the modern manga period, which is relatively straightforward for the most part until you get to about 100 years ago. And then it starts to branch a little bit and it branches a whole lot more and then it just freaking explodes into like a zillion branches. Yeah. So what we're going to cover is some of the major branches basically, but you have to also understand that there are so many sub branches and sub sub branches and that it's like friggin Reddit. Okay. It's just like, there's just a zillion of these little branches and these little <laughs> sub genre things running around. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, go on Reddit, you'll discover pretty quick what I mean. It's just like, there's little branches of everything because the market is just so huge and there's yeah. so many sub markets and underground markets, etc., which we will have no ability to co cover today because <laughs> there just literally isn't time. Yeah. Um, and hell, we probably don't even know more than a fraction of them ourselves because we don't live in Japan. We'd have to really be into that market and really in there to know all those details, I think. Yeah. Um, so... So basically, you're getting the disclaimer that we're going to be doing a really, really shallow look at manga today. <laughs> we're going to give you some details, but the truth is this is still a really shallow dive into the uh, pool of manga. Yeah. Okay, any other disclaimers, Don, before we move in? Before we step our, stick our toe into the pool, so to speak? Nah, there, there's some other things that are going to that are gonna come up that, that um, well, well, we'll hit them when they come up. Um. Like I said, I'm going to try for a lot of things to compare it to the North American way of doing comics. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It it might be helpful. It might just confuse things more. Good go but, way. But we'll see. We'll we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> right. Okay. So I guess we might as well begin. So okay, okay, children, gather around and um, turn your mental way back machines to the year seven hundred. Okay. Yeah, this is going a little farther back than you probably thought. <laughs> Don said 400, but he was underestimating things by quite a few. He was actually lying to you. Don does that sometimes. All right. So year 700, uh, there were a group of workmen. They were rebuilding the Horyuji Temple in Nara, and they got really bored. And for whatever weird reason, they were letting off steam against their bosses, and they decided 
to start drawing little comics. And we know this because we eventually discovered that the ceiling boards of the Horyuji Temple are covered in these little comic books. Well, correction, they're covered in these little cartoons that were mostly them just, you know, being pissed off at their bosses and the people around them and all sorts of other stuff. And this is the first example we have of caricatures, that kind of thing, being drawn by Japanese people. Mm. Now, uh, at least something that resembles a, uh, you know, a comic or a cartoon. Now, there is something that is a little more in line, which is what you'll usually hear about if you do any research on manga, though. Um, which is, in the 1100s, there was a high-ranking Buddhist priest named Toba Sojo. And Toba had some issues with the uh, quality of some of the local monks and <laughs> uh, priesthood. And so, what he decided to do is he started drawing a series of cartoons on scrolls and... To uh, cover his tracks, so to speak, he started drawing all these cartoons about frogs and monkeys and rats and other animals. Yet somehow they were all wearing clothes and, uh, you know, acting just like humans. So in a weird way, the very first Japanese cartoons that we know of that were actually you know, cartoon cartoons and which are done for that kind of purpose are actually furry comics. There you go. Furries go back a really long way. <laughs> What's funny about that, too, is I recall he portrayed the monks as, like, drunken, lecherous louts. So, yeah, basically, he invented furries, like, <laughs> hundreds of years ago. Exactly. That's true. That's very true. They, they actually got super popular. He His scrolls were so popular, they, they started selling copies of them. That's one of the reasons we know about them, is because people were showing up saying, wow, those are great. Can I buy one? And so he, he ended up starting a whole business, probably to make money for his you know church or whatever, selling these things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it became pretty popular. They were known as Toba A or Toba Pictures. Two things to add in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that furries, the partitioners, are necessarily drunken louts, but mm -hmm. a lot of the characters in furrydom are portrayed as such. Yeah, that's true. And, and secondly, what you're getting at, that's an important issue that that for, for manga and comics in general, um, is you've, already, you've, you've got the two oldest examples from Japan. Mm-hmm. And they're both very accessible, and they're both very common. Mm -hmm. That's true. Like these were these were things that interested the average, typical people. Well, they were for common people. Uh, they were mm -hmm. satires, basically, but they were for common people. Yeah. So that's not really a surprise, and it will just continue on from there. Um, mm -hmm. Why? Wait. So the European stuff wasn't for the common people. It was, and that's why I say one of the things um, for comics in general that even today. Mm -hmm. uh, they get maligned for is is they're considered a juvenile that's true and in part i think it's because of the accessibility the idea of like mm. illustrations that simulate action and progression of time like that mm -hmm. you could just look at them it doesn't take like you don't have to translate it in your head like you do shakespeare or that exactly and i think that's something that gets them looked down upon but mm. that accessibility makes them a useful kind of tool of, of the average person. I agree. Yeah. No, no. It makes that accessibility is awesome. That's what made them so popular to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sad in a weird way that comics didn't come truly into their own until already uh, radio and film already were existed and were going concerns by the time comics came around into their own. Yeah. Even though the printing press had been around for like 400 years at that point. Yeah. If people had actually thought of comics much earlier, they would have literally been the dominant form for a very long time. And yeah. it, it's an interesting thing. That, I mean, well, well, okay, to get into that. So after the Toba A, they generally, we didn't see a lot of more examples of this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there, I'm sure there are some existed. Remember, they're on paper, so we've lost a lot of them over time. Uh, yeah. Japan tends to be geologically unstable, which produces other issues. And so... We know that there were lots of uh, books and other things that were sold over the ages, over the following centuries, that were illustrated books and scrolls and landscapes. But none of them were yeah. truly comics, not as we call them anyway. Yeah. Even then, I mean, even by the late 1700s, uh, when, of course, we're into the Tokugawa shogunates, we've got an era of peace, people have money, they have peacetime. So suddenly, since they're not killing each other, that's the other thing <laughs> for most of the from what about the 12th century until the 17th century, the Japanese were kind of preoccupied with constant civil war and killing each other. So there wasn't yeah. really a lot of time for the whole, you know, comic book thing. 
Um, and then the Tokugawa shogunate kicks in, and suddenly there's peace, and so suddenly we've got books everywhere. But again, they have to be a little bit limited because, you know, the shogunate was a little on the harsh side. And um, But among the aristocracy, probably, most likely, there was definitely some popularity there among, you know, different books and things like that. Yeah. Um, scholar Adam Kern places the first use of the term manga in 1798. Okay, there was a guy named Santo Kyoden who apparently actually used it. Um, he was a poet, writer, and artist. And that's the first time we see the word manga, which we probably should take a moment now to define. Right. So I've generally seen manga defined as irresponsible pictures or foolish pictures. Yeah. Um, the, that the man is the irresponsible part or foolish, depending on how you want to go. Um, and the ga refers to pictures. They're from Chinese. They're actually two Chinese characters because that's what the Japanese were using at that point. Right. And there was apparently a movement, uh, Shintaro Ishinomori, um, <laughs> who we'll talk about a little later, actually was part of a movement apparently during the 19, I believe it was the 60s, but it might have been the 70s, mm. to actually change the Mon character for character for million, with the idea being it would represent a million pictures. Mm -hmm. But it just didn't take off. They they tried to do this, but it just never worked. People just kept using the old the old character for you know foolish pictures. So that's what we still use today. Yeah, that that's that that idea is going to come up. Yeah, a little it's, bit. <laughs> it's definitely going to come up. Um, and even the famous uh, Hokusai artist Katsushika Hokusai, uh, who did very sketchbooks, um, did the first tentacle porn. Mm -hmm. um that would be the the oh, was the fisherman's daughter and the octopus no it was uh dreams of a fisherman's wife We're right dreams of a fisherman's wife <laughs> yes sorry dreams of a fisherman's wife and mm -hmm. um and you can buy posters of his stuff everywhere he actually did stuff called hokusai manga so he actually was doing stuff but again these are just single pictures these aren't really what we would call manga today for the most part okay they're they're very simple stuff yeah Manga, as we understand it today, really starts, give or take, about 1868, okay? And Don, quick quiz, do you know what happens in 1868? Oh, you're talking the uh, Meiji Reformation? Yes, we're talking during the Meiji period, yeah. Yeah. 1855 is when Commodore Perry shows up, and yeah. he, oh, he literally kicks open the doors of Japan. He literally yeah. just, you know, kicks everything open, okay? Mm -hmm. And... Generally speaking, this brought a whole bunch of foreigners into the land. And at this point, there already was at least a huge satire comic industry going in Europe and the yeah. Americas as well. With the London magazine Punch being like the magazine. Like that was the, <laughs> the satire magazine like of all. Okay? Yeah. And so this British expatriate named Charles Wurgham shows up. And he's a young guy, relatively speaking, 30. He was a correspondent and sketch artist for the Illustrated London News, okay? And he shows up and settles in Yokohama, because that's where the foreigners settled at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. And he started, like, teaching locals drawing classes, and just to keep himself busy, he starts this magazine called Japan Punch, <laughs> modeled, of course, after the British Punch, which we just mentioned. And it was mostly meant to just satirize some of those stuff he saw going around him. And since he was a visual artist, it was mostly comic pictures. It was like these political satires and cartoons and such. Yeah. And it, it was meant for the expatriates, not for the locals. However, the locals started getting a hold of them and they thought it was awesome. They <laughs> thought they were amazing. And he's considered... Uh, Charles Wurgham, I mean, the forefather of both manga and Western-style Japanese art. Mm. And is the artist who introduced word balloons into Japanese comics. Oh, okay. That's where the Japanese get their word balloons from. Or they were already, I would guess, in Europe, in use in uh, the British comics already. Um, but the Japanese get it from Wurgham. Okay, yeah, because that's... If you go back, mm -hmm. um, looking at stuff that you could consider proto-Japanese comics, they did a lot of, like, um, like mm -hmm. story scrolls, and, and most yes. people have probably seen them or modern versions, that it would be a picture, and a lot of them looked very, like, comic booky, and you'd have, like, dialogue and narration, but it would it would run as kind of an insert, kind of like, um, mm -hmm. like when you see a modern comic book, and they mm -hmm. do narration, it's in a box. Yep. It, everything they did was kind of like that dialogue and that would appear like like that yeah and but the idea of uh, word balloons comes with workum so does a lot of the style that they would later on take 
So, however, Wurgen was not actually alone. Another mm -hmm. fellow, a Frenchman named Georges Bigot, okay? And he arrived in 1882. And he ended up founding a magazine in uh, 1887 called Toba A, named after Toba Shoujo, the guy who did the animal scrolls we mentioned earlier. And he was only in Japan for about 10 years, give or take. But he did do something that was really important, okay? He's the one who introduced the idea of panels in narrative sequence to Japanese okay. comics, okay? So the Toba A um, had the idea that of actions occurring over a period of time being represented by panels. Hmm. So unlike Wurgum, he didn't stay in Japan, but he did have his, a huge influence during the time he was there. Right. So we've got Charles, uh, Charles Wurgum and we've got George Bagot. And between the two of them, they introduced word balloons, style, and they also introduced uh, panels to Japanese comic books and okay. set the standard for what was coming. Okay. They also uh, kind of inadvertently established the, uh, the, the publishing format. Yes, you're right. They did, didn't they? Because by using the British magazine style, they were setting up the publishing format. That's true. Yeah, and if if any of you have ever read uh, any of the old volumes of Punch, which mm -hmm. I have, because the university had a huge stockpile, and I had like three or four hours between classes every day. Uh huh. Um, Punch was like an anthology book. There'd be articles. There'd be like one or two page cartoons. Mm hmm. Um, and and that was what the uh, what um Japanese comics, even today, they're they're anthologies. Right. Yeah, that's true. And so by, wow, you're right. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. He basically set up the whole magazine industry for Japan, basically, by doing mm -hmm. that. Or, well, I'm sure they were also getting regular British magazines as well. So they saw those as well. But but basically, yeah, for comics, they're all anthologies. And that's where it comes from. You're right. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Um, And so they would have a big influence. Punch Japan apparently ran for uh, about 25 years. And they actually referred to um that style as Punchy A, uh, or Punchy A, which would be, of course, Punchy Pictures or that. That's what satirical yeah. comics were basically called for a very long time. Huh. So there you go. Now, mind you, comics sort of took off, but again, they were mostly for adults at this point. Like, they were mostly satirical stuff for adults. Um, yeah. And it would take a few years before we got stuff like in 1895, uh, we got Shonen Sakai, which would be like Young Men's World. Mm -hmm. which was published. And then in 1902, we got Shoujo Kai, or Girls' Kingdom. And these were boys' and girls' magazines that were launched that were basically like, had some picture stories and such. But again, not true comic books, but they're setting, but they're moving in that direction. They're mostly text stories, articles, and some, you know, picture stories for kids. Yeah. However, in 1902, a man named Rakuten Kitazawa, or at least that was his pen name, um, publishes a thing called with okay I'm gonna ma mangle this but I'm gonna try <laughs> Tagizaku and Mokube's Tokyo Trip, okay and he published it in Gigi Shinpo newspaper, okay and this is really important because Rakuten Kita Kitazawa is basically considered the father of manga. Like, you're going to hear the name Osamu Tezuka a little later on, a whole lot. Um, <laughs> and he's referred to, you'll notice, as not the father of manga, but the god of manga. And there's a reason for that. The father of manga is Kitazawa, because he's the very first one who starts doing what is considered a modern manga style. Okay, mm -hmm. where, where you're getting the frames, you're getting the word balloons, you're getting all that stuff starting to come together. And he's the one who would actually develop it. Interestingly enough, he is a student of an Australian artist named Frank A. Nankivel, okay, who actually got stuck in Japan for a couple years and to survive was teaching and working at um, the Punch magazine, at Japan Punch and everything, and brought Kitazawa aboard and taught him Western cartooning styles. So, again, there's a Western connection here where some where some you know european influence specifically british influence and that is creeping in and helping to set the standard for what's going on in japan at this point yeah now not that everything was created by a bunch of british white guys it wasn't <laughs> they're they're just influences like the japanese were kind of running with it once they once they had the idea they kind of ran with it which is something the japanese are very good at doing mm -hmm. And the first actual children's manga magazine that's a true one would come in 1907 with shonen puck uh, I presume Puck is named after the whole, you know, um, 
what uh, Shakespearean puck, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. I might be wrong. Uh, we'll, we'll go with that. That's probably safe. For... It's probably good. <laughs> then an interesting thing happens in 1923. Do you know your Japanese history, Don? Do you know what happens in 1923? Uh, was that when Tom Cruise came and saved all the samurai? Yes, it was. Oh my god, dude! Your ja- no, it's your Japanese history. No, dude, that was eighteen eighty-seven. Um, okay. No, what happened in uh, nineteen twenty-three was the Great Kanto earthquake, and the Great Kanto earthquake more or less reset the Japanese manga industry. In fact, it reset pretty much all of Japan. <laughs> yeah, it's because a- uh, it destroyed Tokyo and. Anything that was left, you got to understand they were living in wooden houses at this point, folks. And mm. so it got wiped out. Fires got started. And so anything that wasn't destroyed in the earthquake got destroyed in the fires. Yeah. And so as an end result, most of the pre-earthquake periodicals that existed from that period, all gone. Like literally, like there, there some things were saved. But this is one of the problems with um, Japanese manga history is that a lot of the stuff and the businesses that were producing them and everything – pretty much wiped out they were all pretty much gone at this point um now there was stuff outside of tokyo of course and some of that was okay but this is one of the reasons why things get a little dicey um there's also of course we're running to the militarism of japan that will follow thereafter um and they're not a big fans of this whole comic stuff in fact you know there was strong censorship going on at this point uh once the military government kicked in yeah however the military government did work out well for one individual Mm-hmm. A certain guy named Suiho Tagawa, mm-hmm. okay, who did a comic book called Norokuro Nito Sotsu, or Second Class Private Norokuro. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with Norokuro, Don? <laughs> yes, I am. Tell, why don't you tell our audience about Norokuro? Okay, um, if I can kind of jump back a bit, just a little bit. Okay, sure. Go ahead. For fast forwarding, back, forth, rough, left, right. It's okay. <laughs> There's two things you have to kind of keep in mind about Japan at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, One is that Japan is just a bunch of like volcanic mountains and rock. So the Kanto Plain, which Mm -hmm. is is basically the only place you can build anything. Not the only place, but it's among the best places to build stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because everything, if you ever see like where all the cities in Japan are, they're in one big clump on the main island. And then they kind of go up the... uh, up the eastern eastern sea coast yes they do and it's because that's where the flat land is so everything is kind of in one spot so when like the earthquake hits Mm -hmm. that's why so much of like japanese history that was wiped out because it's all in that one spot yeah exactly and then literally got burned to the ground what didn't get shaken got burned yeah so so it was a bit of a problem and then the the mil the militarization thing starts because remember it was just a couple of years before mm-hmm. that the Japanese had basically gone to war with Russia and won. Yes, they had, and they're still fighting today over that fucking rock. It's a rock. There's <laughs> I know. it's called it's called an island. They've been disputing this for over a hundred years. It's just a rock. There's nothing on it. There's but, a little more to the Sakhalin Islands than just a rock, but okay, sure. Yeah, there's there's a not, little not yeah, much, but there's a little more. <laughs> there's there's a little. It's 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 more of one of those vague. It could be a problem things, but no, it's 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 a rock. But this meant a lot to Japan because when when the uh, when the black ships came and and, mm-hmm. and the Meiji Reformation happened, they kind of felt bad because they mm. realized that the rest of the world had moved on. That that the reason the uh, Admiral Perry could force them to let his his ships land was because their technology was just like hundreds of years ahead of japan and they felt that by cutting themselves off as they had they Mm -hmm. missed out that's true and then when they went to war with with russia who was one of the world powers and they actually won they were starting to kind of feel their oats and that was where this militarism thing kind of starts up yeah, at this point, they'd already conquered Korea. They'd already conquered Taiwan. Yeah. At this point, they already had a good chunk of uh, the Chinese mainland because Manchu Kuo existed, mm-hmm. which was basically a Japanese colony in, uh, well, here, just, just a little bit north of China, Mongolia. Yeah, it was basically, yeah. A, Japanese, it was basically a Japanese colony in Mongolia. Um, a really interesting one, if you read about it, actually. It was a really interesting thing. And anyway but the key point is so yeah but this was the first time they'd actually kicked european butt and they were feeling pretty good about it that's true mm-hmm. and then that's kind of where your uh private second class there comes in he's a dog yes he is kinda. it's a furry comic yeah he's he's kind of like a a, a weird like 
1920s Fletcher Studios looking dog. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, um, well, a lot of people think the comic was mostly, uh, like, uh, propaganda for the military. Mm -hmm. And when you get into, like, World War II, it kind of was. But, and again, it was this idea that he was kind of a schmo, but he worked hard and, and he never worked his way up the ranks. The easiest way to think of it, it's Beetle Bailey. I was about to say, he's Beetle Bailey if Beetle Bailey was that actual Beetle. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird way of putting it. But yeah, that's amazing. And it's that same, it's that same idea, except um, mm -hmm. Beetle Bailey is kind of played straight just for laughs. That's why, you know, Sarge can assault one of his troops and never get taken before a tribunal. Right. Whereas, whereas our, our little uh, dog soldier there was, mm -hmm. it was kind of presented more as like a more morality play. And right. He was still a goof off, but he tried. Yep. And there's no question that he was like influenced by uh, some Disney stuff because apparently Mickey Mouse actually appears in some Nurikuro comics <laughs> as a character. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> so we can tell where if you look at Nurikuro and you look at the original Disney stuff, it's like, yeah, you can see where this came from. When movies started taking off, they were like really popular in Japan. Mm hmm. It was that uh, that combination of it's a new form of entertainment, but it was a technological marvel. Yeah, yeah, it was. And that's, yeah, there's a whole interesting thing going on there, too. Um, yeah. So so we got Nurikuro, and uh, he's, yeah, he's a dog character. They've apparently made a couple movies, even a couple TV series about him over the years. But he's yeah. one of those uniquely Japanese things that nobody actually outside of Japan really cares about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe because he doesn't power up and is hair doesn't turn yellow or anything like that or i don't know <laughs> but he's he's a very uniquely japanese character and here's a weird bit of trivia so suiho tagawa who created nurikuro actually mentored another manga artist named machiko hasegawa okay who is the creator of sazai-san ah uh, okay which for those who are probably not familiar because again this is another character that's unique to japan and that if you unless you're really into this stuff you will not be aware of mm -hmm. saze-san is basically olive oil that's kind of basically the best way to describe <laughs> her she's like the japanese version of olive oil and, yeah. and as, as comic scholars probably know already um the original stories were about olive oil and her family popeye is one of those characters that actually came later as a kind of guest character and took over the comic yeah but originally, it was just about, what were they called? Not back alley funnies. What were they called? The original... Thimble Theater. Uh, what? Thimble Theater. Yes, there yeah. we go. Sa Sazai-san is basically Thimble Theater, as though as if Popeye never showed up. Okay? Mm -hmm. And, but it kind of came to represent, like, the life of Japanese women. It premiered in 1949, and so it was a post-war thing. And it kind of captured, like, Japanese women's life at the time. It's meant to be, you know, comedy with an edge of a slight bit of drama. They were originally, like, four panel strips which we'll talk about in a second anyway mm -hmm. um but the thing to understand is is that saze stan is also the world's longest running animated series as far as i know i think it's still running today <laughs> and mm -hmm. it started they started animating that thing back in i think it's the 50s might be the 60s but i think it's the 50s and mm -hmm. it's still running today it's kind of like the japanese <laughs> simpsons in a way except it's about 20 to 30 years older than the simpsons at least 30 mm -hmm. probably and uh, so Sazai-san, yeah, it's still running. I've, I've actually seen it. Um, but again, one of those things that nobody outside of Japan knows about or cares about, really. But it's yeah. it's a uniquely Japanese thing. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's that many American Sazai-san fans. If there are, feel free to write to us and uh, or comment in <laughs> our, you know, comment at Obey the Day. A comment at obeythedna.com and uh, let us know that we're wrong, that you are the biggest Sazai-san fan in the world, and <laughs> we will happily you know, uh, admit we're wrong in this case. But generally speaking, <laughs> I don't think Sazai-san has that many fans outside of, the, outside of Japan, really. I think they're pretty rare. Um, speaking of Japanese rarities, oh. okay, go, we're going to go back in time <laughs> a little bit. So in 31, we got uh, Norokuro. Mm -hmm. And then a very important, relatively speaking, character pops up in 1934. Mm -hmm. um, Tanku Tankuro. Yeah. Or sometimes known as Tank Tankuro, depending on how you do it. Who would basically be the very first Japanese mecha super robot kind of <laughs> thing. Um, Don's laughing because he knows what Tanku Tankuro looks like. Okay, imagine this. Imagine a character that's basically a bowling ball with like a human head. 
Okay. And it has these ports all over it. And from those ports on the boiling ball, holes can kind of come out limbs or guns or jet things or whatever, whatever the artist could come up with. Mm -hmm. And that's Tanku Tenkuro. And yeah. he's, he's bizarre. He, and sometimes it would literally be like the lower balls would produce tr tank treads and then he'd have a gun sticking out. And he is just the most messed up thing ever. <laughs> he really is. He's super messed up. But Funny. the Japanese loved him. Well, you know what he is? What? In a lot of ways is he's uh, the Japanese version of Felix the Cat. Oh, you're right. He is actually. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because Felix the Cat had his bag of tricks and he could turn mm -hmm. it into whatever. Well, Tank Tank Hurl could do that. There's like one of the stories to distract the enemy troops. He fires money at them. Oh, okay. And it was just whatever weird gimmick the they could come up with to have him do, that's what he would do. So he was kind of like Felix's bag of tricks. Yep. Which makes you wonder if it's a coincidence that he has cat whiskers. Ho, ho, ho. You're right. He does. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, well, again, there's a lot of cross-pollination going on. At this point, people don't think think this is happening, but it was. There mm -hmm. were, you know, as we've mentioned, Disney movies were being shown in Japan. Magazines yeah. from all over the world were accessible in Japan, especially in Tokyo. I mean, they're seeing all this stuff. They're reading all this stuff. And so yeah. a lot of it's there to be to act as inspiration. So there's cross-pollination going on. I'm sure if we looked hard enough, we could probably find some Japanese stuff actually inspiring stuff in America or Europe even at some point too. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely the Europeans and the Americans are definitely uh, helping the Japanese along, so to speak, in terms of their you know, development of their comic industry. And at this yeah. point, we should also make a little pause and say that at this point, um, most Japanese comics, I use the word term comics almost in quotes, because mm -hmm. the majority of them are basically four panel gag strips. Yeah. Like that's really what's the most popular. Their Japanese uh, gag strips run, um, they're, they're just like the Western three panel gag strips, except there's four panels and they run top to bottom instead of running uh, left to right. Other than that, they're basically like the you know the 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 newspaper comics that most people listening to this probably grew up with, mm -hmm. and um, they appeared in newspapers, they appeared in magazines, they appeared all over the place. Yeah. And as far as I know, um, Nor Norokuro, um, Tenku Tenkuro, they're all pretty much gag strips for the most part. Yeah, they they were, but those ones. Um, one of the reasons, if you look into the history of comics, those two come up is you'd look at them and they look like a comic. They look like a, like yeah. a comic book. Mm -hmm. That's like true. the way they're, the way the panels are done. Um, the, uh, I've seen them called young coma. The, the four panels. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. They're called young coma. Young is four and coma, yeah. being, you know, four, which basically means like four comic or four panel or whatever. Yeah. That's what yeah. they're called. Yeah. Like those, those, um, you mentioned the newspaper strips. That's probably the best way to think of it. Mm. Um, at the same time, when all this is going on in Japan, remember in America, Mm -hmm. newspaper strips and comics are, are are kind of a big thing they're just starting to take off yes like the 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 1910s to like 1930s that's like the golden age of the newspaper strip it absolutely is yeah oh yeah, yeah. and i mean it would be it's the 1920s isn't it when uh, they combined the first newspaper strip to form uh famous funnies or something like the very first american comic book yeah isn't it's like it's like 26 the, is it uh, I think the first one was like 1919. Was it? Yeah, and it was a collection, but it was like a one shot. And then um, the the famous funny started. I want to say it's the. Uh, okay, I, go look. I was gonna say since I borrowed the internet from Jack. You okay? Awesome. That was so nice of Jack to lend us the internet. <laughs> Um, While well, you're checking that out, so now mind you, there's a catch. Um, I found a reference. I believe it was 1915. Mm -hmm. The very first multi-page Japanese comic story appeared. Yeah, and that was apparently in. It was like a 15-page story appeared. So they did occasionally do actual. We'll call it long-ish form comic books mm -hmm. that weren't just the four-panel stuff. They did were actually appearing, but they weren't the most popular stuff. And they weren't yeah. they, they weren't the standard at this point. Yeah, there um, and they wouldn't become the standard for a very long time. Yeah. Famous so, funnies. Famous funnies was a uh, first was nineteen twenty nine. Ah, okay. I was I was slightly off, but okay. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that was done, I believe, by George Gaines's father. 
was that one one of games? Because yeah, remember his I remember, yeah, because he talks about that in um, oh my god, I can't believe I'm for, I'm blanking on the name. Um, the movie Comic Book Confidential. He yeah. he talks about that in Comic Book Confidential. How about how his father was the one who assembled the first uh, comic book? I thought I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he I'm pretty sure that was that was his father that did that. Um, yeah. which helped inspire him on his career. But that's the American comics episode. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. Right. Um, so anyway, so, and definitely by the 40s in that, um, it was the gag strip. There's also another reason by the, why by the 40s it was the gag strip, mm-hmm. um, which is that starting in the late 30s, early 40s, for all, apparently about 10 years, there's this kind of war going on. <laughs> and uh, you might have heard about it. It was called World War II. Um, and so as an end result, cause remember the, oh, sorry, I should back up a tiny bit. The Japanese started fighting World War II a little bit early when they started conquering mainland China. Mm-hmm. They already controlled Taiwan and Korea for 50 years at this point, but they were kind of working their way into China at this point. Okay. And so because of this, they needed resources among other things. They needed paper. Yeah. So as an end result, there was a paper shortage going on. And so for the most part, magazines and newspapers were very limited and very short. So literally for a period of almost 10 years, you couldn't do anything long form because you didn't have the room. Yeah. Like what you were working with, what paper you could get your hands on. And in fact, there's actually a reference I saw going back to Nor- Norokuro again. That was one of the very few comics that coincidentally enough um, <laughs> never suffered from the newspaper shortage. Yeah. Apparently... For whatever reason, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, the military <laughs> comic about a happy-go-lucky soldier during World War II and, you know, was, was something that the Japanese uh, had no problem getting a hold of. Let's yeah. put it that way. Well, there's, there's a catch, too, mm-hmm. um, from kind of just before that time. And it's, it's a weird sort of thing that affects um, the Japanese comic industry. And that was the, uh, the uh, Kashi Hon. The, the rental catch. libraries. Yeah. Actually, they don't come until 1949. They don't, but what happened in, in the Edo period, mm-hmm. you had um, you had kind of the uh, the prelim to that idea, right? And it was like kind of like a library, mm. the 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 Japanese equivalent, because even even then, like paper was always kind of expensive. Yes, because again, you can't grow anything anywhere really. Oh, uh, oh, what are you talking about? Japan's covered in forests. I've been there. It's covered oh, okay. in forests, dude. It really is. Uh, in fact, they call it the sea. Was it the sea of trees? I think they call it. Go into, uh, go up in the mountains in Japan. My mm. God, it's just like endless trees. Like it's these bumps of land, which are mountains covered in trees. Trust me, they have trees. They have lots <laughs> of trees. I okay, was but... shocked. It was, it's kind of almost scary. When you go up in the mountains, just how wilderness like Japan actually becomes as soon as you get out of the cities. As soon as you get off the Kanto Plain, it becomes like this total sea of trees. It really does. Yikes. At least some of it does. Like we're talking mid Honshu, basically. Right. Uh, some of the other parts are a little more uh, settled. But there are some, especially <laughs> up in the mountains and that, it's astounding. It really is. It, mm-hmm. um, I was just there last year. It's like I couldn't believe how thick that forest actually was. Like, wow. And I'm a Canadian. I'm used to thick forests. And that was impre- <laughs> I was impressed. I was really impressed, actually. Anyway, wow. um, so, but you're right. Um, paper was, though, because it took effort. And, and yeah. it, anyway, the Japanese were poor. Let's be honest. They were, even mm-hmm. during this period. There, there, was a, there were a lot of poor people in Japan. And yeah. so they had to find cheap ways to get their entertainment. And one of the more common ones was these rental libraries, which were basically private libraries where you basically paid a couple yen or less, mm-hmm. um, basically a couple pennies, basically, to get access and go and sit there and read. Yeah. And that's how a lot of Japanese would actually encounter books, basically. They couldn't afford them themselves. They would read these books and magazines at these rental libraries. Mm-hmm. Um, and in 1949, they would really kind of blossom. Yeah. Again, around the same time. Okay, let's let's continue then. Um, unless you had something else you want to cover? No, because that, no. that kind of comes up in a little bit, the idea of the uh, the like the, the rental comics. Right. Okay. So in 1946, um, right after the end of World War II, in Mayanichi Shoko Kimun Shimbun, Shimbun being newspaper, a comic called Machan no Niko, or Machan's Diary, debuted. Okay. It was a four panel gag strip out of a mysterious kid and his reluctant friend in post war Tokyo. It was very popular, ran for a bit. It was by a 17 year old noob um, named Osamu Tezuka. 
Okay, and it just popped. And he was so um, Suzuka, I mean, was so bolstered by the success of Machan that in 1947, February, he released Shin Takarajima or New Treasure Island, which was kind of this modern-ish at that time period, of course, um, retelling of Robert Louis Stevenson's novel Treasure Island with. Uh, elements of Western movies and comics and, and st- kind of this Disney-ish style and everything, again, yeah. by Tezuka. Um, but the key here is it's a book-length work. Mm-hmm. And that's the really important part is there had been some stuff that was longer form before this, but Tezuka basically released a whole, effectively the equivalent of a whole novel in comic form. Yeah. And people lost their minds. <laughs> they basically, <laughs> this was the greatest thing ever. When they found, when they started, and he started his whole like boom at this point, um, yeah. or well, yes and no. I shouldn't say he started the boom. He, did, but this was the beginning of a very long and successful career that, uh, by his death in 1989, would involve 700 manga titles and 100 animated films and TV series, mm-hmm. and of course, would later, you know, lead to a lot of other things as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, you know, so Tezuka, who we referred to as earlier as the god of comic books, because he is. He's basically the Japanese version of Walt Disney. If Walt Disney was an actual comic artist instead of a businessman. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Disney basically gave up the whole actual creativity thing as soon as he started making real money and could get other people to do it. Whereas Tezuka paid other people money to take care of the business stuff while he just kept drawing. Yeah. And animating. And everything else. Yeah. And... um and this is really important because Tezuka, once he started to become successful, would eventually end up, um, oh, he would do so many things. But we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm kind of, again, jumping ahead. As I mentioned, <laughs> in 1949, uh, Kashibon, or Rental Libraries, first appeared. Um, mm-hmm. They would be the forerunners to Kisaten, or manga cafes, that would come later on. Yeah. Um, and... Again, pay a few pennies, you go in, you can read your manga or comics or that all day. These came at the same time in 1949 with something that were called Red Books. Okay? Red Books were basically single story manga. In other words, they were collections mostly of like even gag strips or whatever, all of the same comic, not an anthology, appearing in one book. Mm-hmm. And they were named Red Books because they were printed with cheap red ink on cheap paper. So they were literally red. They were using red ink because it was just cheap at that time for whatever reason. And that would be very important as well because these red books were also an example of, well, if you bring all these manga together in one book, you can sell them just like, you know, Tezuka's work, Shin Takarajima, which, and Tezuka, after Shin Takarajima, kept producing lots and lots of these, like, kind of manga novels, you could almost call them. They were all mostly his adaptions of, like, famous fairy tales at first, but eventually they became more and more original as he went. Okay, 1949. And I think I'm going to collapse on, so tag, you're it. <laughs> okay. Um, now, this is where you're going to notice there's a lot of, uh, again, every decade has kind of its thing. Uh, when you start getting into the uh, into the 1950s, mm-hmm. you've got a, um, one of the, uh, the, you've got magazines that are coming out that print comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome. Yeah, the the main one at the, uh, in the forties was one called uh, Manga Shonen, mm-hmm. which which I, I believe you mentioned. That was kind of the uh, the 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 premiere. But you were starting to see all kinds of them when you get into fifties and the country starts getting rebuilt. Mm-hmm. Um, what ends up happening is you start getting uh, mass production, and mass production becomes cheaper. You've got more people involved in the process, which means people have jobs. They've got money. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you start to see the uh, like the rental stores kind of diminish because people can now buy mm-hmm. their own, and they're being published in these in in the compilations like the the manga shonen, which uh, like we were saying is modeled after the British ones, mm-hmm. where it's an anthology. You you get this thing, you get a bunch of different things, and it's most importantly, it's really really cheaply produced. Yes, it is. One of the things that had happened because of the rental places was it helped develop an audience, mm-hmm. especially right after the war, because nobody had money. Everybody was depressed. You're looking for some cheap yucks. Well, yeah, I go drop a penny or two and I can sit here all day reading these like weird, fantastical kind of stories and gag strips and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that kept the audience alive. That kind of um, gave them bigger, a bigger audience like 
everybody was bored and this was kind of the only game in town entertainment wise. We had kind of a similar thing going on here with uh, the newspaper strips that everybody read the newspaper strips. They weren't just considered kid stuff. Yep. In North America, comic books fell into that trap. I still say because of the uh, 1954 Senate subcommittee hearing on juvenile delinquency. I would absolutely say that's what that's what basically neutered our comics. I mean, yeah. I would argue that we were actually running ahead of the Japanese in terms of comic book acceptance, in mm-hmm. terms of in terms of the type of stuff we were producing and the quality. We were actually way ahead of the Japanese at this point in terms of just you know comics as an art form, basically. At least by say, I, by we I say North Americans. Um, and then the Senate subcommittee happens in 1954 that basically turns all comic books into kid stuff, into literally G-rated kid stuff from that point on for quite a while. Yeah. And, and neuters and, us, basically. And the irony there is why I say that was the case is because comic books thereafter were considered kid stuff, but newspaper strips weren't. Mm-hmm. That's true. Newspaper strips are still legit entertainment. You could tell because... After the, uh, the the Comics Code came out here in North America, which wasn't enforced by the government. It was the comic industry basically getting together to thump the shit out of uh, EC Comics. Yeah, yeah. When that code came out, it forced everything to be kidified. You couldn't show, like, real violence. You couldn't have death. You couldn't have, like, um, you couldn't portray... You really couldn't portray crime for the mm. longest time. Yep. Uh, that was why supervillains wanted to take over the world all the time, because there's no law against it. Um, whereas, though, in the newspaper strips, he still had the action strips. Dick Tracy was killing off villains in various disturbing, grotesque ways. And yes, nobody, bat- nobody bat an eyelash over that. Yeah, you'd think they would, but they weren't. No, and it's because, again, in the mind of the public, comic book and comic strip were two different things. Mm. Even though they have a common order. In Japan, you never quite got that. And I think part of it, too, might have been because of these these rental places and the compilations. The format never separated comic strip from comic book. Yep. So the, the Oncoma, the mm-hmm. gag strips, which are just like a newspaper strip, except they go from top to bottom, were appearing in the exact same place as the comic books, as the longer form stories. That's true. And um, because of that, you you still had more room to experiment and find an audience. Yes, that's true. And by the way, in when we get to the 1950s, sorry to, there will actually be more and more people trying. Um, at, okay, two things were happening at this point. There were some serials, and also they were starting in the 1950s. Sorry to jump in on you and that, but we're that's also okay. getting into the uh, short story market, which started popping up, where you start getting people that are telling longer stories, but what we would still consider a short story, basically kind of the equivalent to like a TV episode's worth of stuff. Like it's a one shot, all these one shot short stories started popping up because I think part of this is because readers couldn't be guaranteed to get every part of the story at this point. Because remember, you're just getting them in these rental stores where sometimes it might be hit or miss. Mm -hmm. And so they started focusing on these anthologies that were all just these short stories. No, these short one stuff. But there were some attempts anyway at uh, longer form stuff. Oh, and I'm forgetting the name of the first longer for... I just just read it last week. Uh, anyway, whatever. Anyway, uh-huh. we'll, we'll, <laughs> it's not that important. But so we were still getting in the 1950s. We're getting some longer form stuff. And so a lot of which actually is targeted towards like adults or more mature audience. I know that as well. Yeah. There, um, the 1950s, Japan was actually having a huge detective boom, among other things. Yeah, basically the pulp era happened in Japan in the 50s. Yeah, it did. Which it kind of happened here in the 50s too, so that's fair, but... Oh, you're right. I guess it was more 30s and 40s, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting how how many parallels there are. But okay, we'll go yep. with that. So anyway, so yes, they're having their pulp era in both comic and text form. They were they had their, those uh, rental libraries also had like text, you know, pulp magazines as well. They were also yep. very popular as well at that point. Um, yep. Not quite as popular with the kids, of course, as uh, the comics are. But that's the way it goes. Mm-hmm. Because that was the thing, the pulp era happens here during that time in, in North America. Remember, that was the Atomic Age. Yes. And the Atomic Age does proliferate in Japanese culture in starting in 1952 mm-hmm. with um, basically the, 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 the comic that kind of start, kick-started the Japanese comic industry, which was uh, Tezuka's Tetsuan Atom. Yep. 
which yeah. we know here is Astro Boy. Yep. Yep. Who, yeah, really, really kickstarts the whole thing. Yep. Uh, on that, every level. Because that was a mega hit. Yep, it was. It was the first, I'd say, probably since Tenku Tenkuro or um, Norokuro, this was probably the very first true ultra mega hit in Japan. Maybe, And maybe you, you could say it even eclipses those two, really, and Sazai-san. Yeah. Sazai-san, maybe not, because that thing won't die. But, <laughs> well, there is that. Okay, valid point. But this, it's also the idea that um, what happens with Tetsuwan Adam has kind of some long-reaching effects. Mm-hmm. in the Japanese industry. One of it is uh, the style that he uses for it. Mm-hmm. Like Tezuka, Tezuka's house style. Um, it's usually attributed to Carl Barks. Right. Because Tezuka was a huge Disney fan. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the reasons why his comics were a little different because they were more cinematic. They were yeah. he, He'd lay them out and do the panels more like shots from a movie. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of comics, and even if you remember like the old newspaper strips from like the 30s and the 40s here, a lot of them were very static. Mm. And a lot of that had to do with the origins of comic that because they were done so small, it was difficult to do something ornate and still have it print properly. Mm. That's true. But you had guys like here back in the the, the 20s that you had somebody like say Windsor McKay that Mm -hmm. would do these crazy full page layouts and that. And that starts the thing rolling for what eventually becomes comics here uh mighty adam tetsuwan adam astro boy kind of starts that ball rolling in japan um yep. it's science fiction it talks about the future it's super optimistic it's the kind of thing that people had never seen before yeah that's true that's very true and he, he truly ush- was ushering in the atomic age and that's literally yep. what he was he was yep. he was the future and he was you know going right for it um, and so people had not seen anything like that. In fact, Astro Boy would, of course, end up also being, I believe, it's considered the first animated series as well. Mm-hmm. Like the first Japanese animated TV series is Astro Boy. Yeah. Because it was so popular, they decided we're going to animate this thing for TV. Like yeah. the very first version, which means which means it's what we would today call a motion comic. But at that time, <laughs> they called it animated. Yeah, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's uh, for its time, they sunk a couple of bucks into it. And then... What happens because of that mm-hmm. is uh, Tezuka starts uh, Musai Studios. Yes. Or Musai Productions. Mm-hmm. Which I is... Uh, yep, go. Oh, it was it was um, his studio that mm-hmm. would do the comics and it did the... Uh, it was actually instrumental in the animation. Right. And that kind of set the tone for, for a little while that um, when he started seeing the comics getting popular enough to be adapted... Mm-hmm. especially to tv they were a little more faithful than we tend to do here and i think it's because again from tezuka's influence he had a lot of say in what they did with every one of his stories yeah yeah he did and because he formed the template for how the industry should work i think that just kind of got subsumed into that yep i would agree yeah i would even, agree even the idea of what for for the longest time people thought of as the i'm, I'm doing finger quotes here the manga style mm-hmm was very Tezuka. Yes. And Tezuka, again, he, he, he borrowed from uh, like the Disney stuff, Carl Barks. I would say that uh, Freddie Moore was probably a huge uh, influence on Tezuka's style as well. Okay, how so? Uh, if you ever saw the original Snow White, mm-hmm. she's a manga character. Yes, she is. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. And that was, again, one of Tezuka's like, favorite films. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, I can totally see that. Yeah, yep. yeah, I can totally see that in his style. And even then, that sensibility worked into his his stuff where you had, uh, you look at Snow White, you had, like, say, Snow White, the Queen, the Prince, very realistic-ish characters. Mm-hmm. The Prince, the Queen were done realistically. Snow White followed a more realistic template, but they cartooned her up to increase the appeal. Mm-hmm. And then he had all these like goofy animals and, and really cartoony dwarves that just kind of were part of the same kind of right. the same work. And that's what Tezuka would do is that he would use like this combination of like these goofy characters, and these more serious characters. And eventually it got to the point where he's using this really cartoony story to tell like style to tell these like heavy, like really sometimes bleak, like kind of 
kind of stories. And it's that, that weird effect. And I think, again, he borrows that a great deal from Disney. Right. Well, that makes sense. So the other thing that happened in the 50s, too, that's pretty big was uh, Weekly Manga Times. Uh, actually, can we go back one minor thing before then? Uh, just as okay. we're on Tezuka. In 1953, he did something else, actually, that was actually rather important. Uh -huh. um, he created R Ribbon no Kishi, uh, or yeah. uh, Princess Knight, which is basically the first Japanese girls comic. So yep. he, cre he creates... He, the the best way to compare this to is is it's as though um it's as though Stan Lee created Spider Man and then created Harlequin Romance in his like spare time. That's kind of the way kind of the way it worked. I mean, literally, he created two whole industries: one targeted at men and boys, <laughs> and one targeted at women. Literally within the, like a year or two of each other. <laughs> that like that's not actually an exaggeration. He really did that. Yeah, that's kind of a. Uh... That's kind of a good way of uh, of putting it. Uh, I'm not sure it's a good way of putting it, but it'll have to do <laughs> anyway. So sorry to interrupt, but yeah, so that's something to keep in mind. He he literally started the girls' comics industry. That was yeah. that was him that did that. Yeah, they they kind of existed before, mm -hmm. because you did have you did have stories that would lean more towards like boys or girls. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of the yeah they idea. did. Oh, I talked about that earlier, where there were yeah. boys and girls comic magazines. But this is the but he created what is basically became the the literal kind of seed of the the shoujo manga, basically. Yeah, because this is this is again where you start to see the shonen, the shoujo stuff. Because mm. uh, it existed before, but you didn't have the formula for it, right? And they weren't hugely different. Like that's um, if you go back here to newspaper strips from like the twenties and the thirties. You did have ones that would be ain't more for females and males, but again, mm -hmm. they all drew from the same well. Right. And Tezuka was doing that, but he's where you can start seeing that division. And I think it's because Tezuka is one of the, the guys that was really obsessed with kind of the nature of comics in general. Right. And he was always experimenting with what comics were as opposed to just doing them. That would make sense. Yeah, and I think, again, that's why you see this, this where that division starts, because he starts thinking, you know, what if we take the act, because Raimon is basically an action story mm -hmm. that he kind of softened a bit and added more character interaction kind of stuff to. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, it's not quite a, it's not quite a soap opera, but you can see it start to go that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas again, like your your mighty Adam and that is starting to go the boys' way because it's it's got that kind of interaction, but the interaction is more like compatriotism as opposed to any kind of like like tender feelings or or that, right? And it's starting to focus more on like the action that it's it's deeds not words to borrow from a movie that nobody had ever seen, right? So and that's where and that's where you get that. Mm hmm. Because, cause again, like I say, you were starting, you had that, that ability because the mm -hmm. economy is starting to pick up that you could be more experimental. You didn't have to just pander to make a sale. Yes. And there was a huge demand. Like I've read um, um, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, another, well, I'll explain him in a second. I read his uh, autobiographical manga, uh, A Drifting Life. Uh, mm -hmm. Where he talks about that, or he talks about life. It's basically an eight-volume, uh, huge story about like being a manga artist in the 1950s and what it was like. And um, yeah, there were there was a huge demand for for skilled manga artists, like because mm -hmm. it as as the 50s went on, it took off, and there just was not enough artists. There was not enough produ people producing this stuff. So a lot of the artists of that time were working under multiple pen names and producing multiple works for multiple magazines at the same time. So as an end result, you kind of could take your pick of who you wanted to work for and what you wanted to do. And that was a that was a pretty it was a good time to be an artist, although they a lot of them burnt themselves out doing it. Yeah. Yeah, because at the same time, too, you could even see uh, the same character show up in different publications. Occasionally. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, part of that's because of the uh, the Japanese business system, mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, Keiretsu 
actually, from what I've read from Tatsumi's bio there, that's not exactly true. Mm -hmm. The big companies at first were actually pretty reluctant to get involved in the whole manga thing. Originally, it was actually mostly a bunch of, it was mostly smaller publishers. Mm -hmm. As the 50s went on, you started to get the Kiretsu and that looking at going, you know, there's money in this. And as soon as they smell money, they start getting involved because they're the big concerns. But they let the small guys basically kind of uh, pave the way basically before they moved in. Yeah, and, and then remember, too, a lot of the small guys would be, uh, and this is why I say the idea of Karetsu, mm-hmm. they were affiliated with a bigger company. Mm-hmm. They weren't like, it wasn't like they were they were a branch of it. They weren't owned by it. Mm-hmm. But you had their, they're kind of like, like corporate gangs that they, they have um, an understanding. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, it's hard to explain because we totally don't do that here. But that's well, it's, yeah, they're all connected with each other, and they all help each other out. Yeah, and, and it's it's not necessarily business connections. Sometimes it could just be familial. Sometimes it could just be you have a buddy in this big company, and he's like, "Oh, these guys are up to something interesting." So this bigger company kind of keeps an eye on the little one, uses it as like the bush leagues or or whatever. Mm, yeah, that happens. That's true. Mm. Yep, all kinds of connections. Um, yeah. So yes, in uh, so yeah, the um, weekly weekly manga book came out as you mentioned, and that was yep. a big deal. Um, yep. Also, another thing that popped up was a the longest running manga strip by single author popped up in 1956, mm-hmm. um, and uh, this is Kokojima's Senen Braku, oh, um, which apparently is still running. Mm-hmm. It's uh, apparently it's this sex comedy thing about. Um, about a Chinese village with basically a Taoist master and he's got a lecherous student Mm -hmm. and his student basically gets in trouble like chasing women all the time. (laughs) And um, apparently it's still running to this day and it started in 1956. (laughs) It's again, one of those things that, uh, yeah, like Saze-san, it's, uh, it's one of those ones that if you're not Japanese, you have no idea what this is, but it's yeah. there they've been doing this for a long time yeah and we get that here too like most of the uh the newspaper strips now some of them yeah yeah like like blondie or the aforementioned beetle bailey like oh yeah they're and they're still around so yeah i think they are anyway oh they are they are and and they'd be a lot of them would be totally indecipherable mm-hmm. to somebody who wasn't like raised in north america yeah that's true and even I can, then i can see that yeah some of them are so s- kind of stuck in their uh stuck in their origin that even if you did grow up in North America, they're still kind of baffling. Yeah, that's true. So... That's very true. <laughs> also, in 56, I should bring, since we're, you know, fans of the boys stuff, mm-hmm. I should bring uh, another name into this. Um, there was another guy uh, who's a protege of Tezuka named Mitsuteru Yokoyama. Mm. Um, and in uh, Shonen Monthly Magazine, he introduced a comic called Tetsujin 28 Go. Yeah. Also known in the American version that would come later as Gigantor or yeah. Tetsujin 28, Iron Man 28, basically, um, which is the very first mecha, more or less. He's the he's a three story tall um, robot super weapon that was left over from World War II that is controlled by the 10 year old grandson of the inventor. Yeah. And he uses it to fight, you know, um, bad robots and stuff. Now, it's not piloted. You know, the kid stands there with his watch. People here, if you've seen Giant Robo, that's what that's it. It's Giant Robo basically. Giant Robo would basically be a live action version of it. Yeah, there was there was a bunch because um, the idea of of a robot that you pilot like a vehicle doesn't show up for like another twenty years. Yep, yep. I go to guy, I believe, but we'll yep. we'll we'll get to him later, of course. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so we've got him. The other thing that happens during the fifties, sorry to introduce, interrupt the fifties on you, but just, That's I just okay. wanted to bring a few <laughs> of these things up. Um, the aforementioned Yoshihiro Tatsumi, um, however, was really dissatisfied. He and a bunch of the other mangas were dissatisfied because the truth is manga, and this is going to shock you, was basically considered to be kid stuff. Mm. Even well, though these adult ish, you know, stories were being pumped out these short stories for yeah. the most part the target audience was still kids they were still young yeah it was ki- kids or it was also considered it was, it was like the the kind of like the uh comics in the pulp era kid stuff or lowbrow exactly it was lowbrow stuff for the most part but um tatsumi and the others figured that they could actually do something more okay mm-hmm. and so what they did is they um started a, a group 
which was called I don't remember what sorry okay they started a group that they were produced what they called Gekiga mm-hmm. okay Gekiga <laughs> is literally as opposed to manga which would be foolish pictures Gekiga would be dramatic pictures yeah with the idea of creating a label that would basically say this is not the foolish crap for your for your kids or for lowbrow this is actual human drama basically and in fact yeah. they would actually produce stories that were literally about daily life and involved sex and violence and drugs and other things at that time this was kind of the beginning of or, and the foundation of what would be kind of Japan's alternative comics movement of the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, even though the Gekiga group he initially formed didn't last very long, it would still be a... Uh, it, this moment was basically kind of a seminal moment for the alt, for a, other, a non-Tezuka form of Japanese comics, basically. Because Tezuka yeah. was basically the template for all the 50s. Tatsumi would set up what would become the 60s template. Yeah, because... Um, kind of the, the other, the, the, the last big takeaway from the fifties, mm-hmm. one of the things that you had, cause you're right. Tezuka took over that kind of, um, the, the cleaner style, the, um, the more cartooniness mm-hmm. quickly became the, the, the pattern. There were people dissatisfied, including what you kind of had to, um, going into the late fifties, you had the Gekiga guys. And you also had the beginning of what will later be considered seinen. Yes. And and mm-hmm. seinen is probably what we here would call dark and gritty. Yes. Yeah, it is. Oh, hold on. Seinen basically would refer to... The, sorry, this is where you have to understand the Chinese characters involved and the way the Japanese are using them. Because sei basically means like changing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, what, that's what it means in this sense. It's actually from, the, from a Chinese character that basically means change. And so what's really going on is Seinen is actually meant to be kind of like 18 to 30. Yeah. It's basically meant to be what we call university student age. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you're at that phase where you're going from being a young person to being a, you know, to being an adult, but it's actually not, it's meant to be that age where you're looking for something with a little more bite and you're looking for something that's a little more um, adult but maybe not a hundred percent. Like it's still, there are of course comics for old people too. We'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Yeah. But the seinen genre itself is basically targeted towards, yeah, about 18 to what? 18 to 30 basically. Yeah. You could say, and, and yeah, it's, it, it tends to be a, yeah, a little darker, a little more uh, questionable morality shows up in it. Yeah, exactly. More, more violence. Yeah, and just for just for reference, there's also Jose, which is mm-hmm. the seinen is actually targeted towards adult men, adult-ish yeah. men, and then there's actually Jose, which is for adult-ish women. Yeah, I think I think Jose covers the same rough range as the seinen stuff does, because um, I know that there's there's more. But anyway, we'll mm-hmm. uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so we got the, so we got the formation of Seinen, but that will come basically as an adaptation from the Gekiga. Like the, yeah. basically the best way to describe it is you've got Tezuka's style, which is, we'll call it the standard mon- young people's manga style at the time. The Gekiga appears and that's a lot more, um, serious, re- serious Sober. in many different ways. Yeah. And then eventually the Gekiga will even become more realistic and go for a more re- realistic shocking style. And then that, I believe, will combine basically into what we call seinen. I think that's the way it works. Yeah, there, there, there's, another, there's another thing that kind of has to happen first, but that's not till the 70s. And I think we're just entering into the 60s. Where you're right. Okay, so we'll, so we'll so we'll get to there. Um, and so okay, so we're into the '60s now. Uh, we're just hitting the 1960s. Um, so let's see what else has to happen. In the, so what happens in the 1960s? Well, 60s ends up, as I've just said, becoming the era of the Gekiga in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, because the young people that are born uh, post World War II are now becoming teenagers. They want stuff that's a little more has a little more bite to it perhaps than some of Tezuka's stuff. Um, although Tezuka himself will actually produce what are basically Geki guy and stain and work because he does everything. Cause he's yeah. Tezuka. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I seriously, he does everything. He tries everything, everything you can. I think Tezuka <laughs> even does like hentai at one point, if I remember right, or something that's close to it. Cleopatra. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, there we go. 
he so Suzuki even does porn at one yeah. point. I, like that dude literally tries every single comic <laughs> form he can he can find. He just he never read a form of comic book he does not like. True. Um. Anyway, so we've got that that happens. Um. And uh. So okay. So we hit the nineteen sixties. Now, what's interesting I like to compare though is. Thanks to the comics code, as we talked about earlier in the comics subcommittee, Americans wouldn't actually have their alternative comics boom until the 1970s. Yeah. Okay. And I would argue that's again because of the whole comics code thing. Well, the Japanese didn't have some stupid comics code holding them back. So in a lot of ways, they have their 1970s underground comics boom. They ha- The Japanese have it in the 1960s. And so this results in a whole lot of different comic styles and stuff being tried out. Like this, the sixties is a truly experimental period for Japanese comics. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, another thing that comes out of the sixties, among other things, is sports manga. Mm-hmm. Um, the Japanese had, uh, you know, loved sports for a very long time. They'd been obsessed with baseball since like the eighteen hundreds <laughs> uh, when it was first introduced. Um, but the very first. Uh, true sports manga that appeared a baseball manga called star of the giants or kyojin no hoshi appears in 1966 and uh, it's about a gifted uh b- former b- baseball player who basically gets tortured into becoming an amazing baseball player by his you know father and teammates and stuff like that um see there's the thing if you read any <laughs> sports manga of this era it's basically about athletes getting tortured almost to death in the name of improvement <laughs> Like really, it is. That's that's kind of what it's all about. It's all yeah. it's all about uh, it's all about the torture. And if you don't believe me, go find um, Tomorrow's Joe or Ash to Know Joe, <laughs> which is not from the '60s though. That's a '70s book. Yeah. Um, but well, in fact, most of the popular sports manga will be the '70s, but it actually starts in the in the mid to late '60s. Mm-hmm. We start getting that stuff. Um, the '60s is also, of course, when uh, TV anime is starting to expand. So. They're, they're including stuff that's connected. Of course, uh, anime and manga are now becoming intimately connected with each other. They kind of have been from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So that's there. Uh, we're starting to see uh, girls' comics. We're starting to see girls' comics that are actually produced by girls. Because mm-hmm. uh, in the 50s, the pr- girls' comics are produced by men for the most part. But in the 60s, I believe it is. Let me double check that. There's a group called the Group of 24. They were a group of young women. They were born in Imperial Year 24. That's what mm-hmm. they're called, the Group of 24. And they're this group of young uh, female comic artists. And they basically take this the girls' comic stuff that Suzuka and friends were doing, because there were like a couple of male comic guys that were doing most of the girls' comics. Mm-hmm. And they basically ran with it. Um, they basically just took it. They, they basically said, nope, we're going to make girls comics. And they did. And they basically started the true girls comic style that, uh, that we think of today, basically. Um, mm -hmm. see, that's one of the things where I think, uh, we hear missed out on. Right. Because we never, we never really had that. Um, Mm. the, 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 the closest we, we, we always kind of dabbled. And I don't just mean like the idea of like girls comics, but because especially after the, the, uh, the jewel delinquency thing there, we tended to pigeonhole things. And once you do that, you get really specific kind of Mm -hmm. stories that just repeat again and again and again. And we never had like, say a lot of female cartoonists in that in our comic books for a long time, mostly just because there was nothing that interested them. Yeah. Like that was the advantage of of Tezuka doing something like Ribon was that um, it appealed to a, a female audience, mm-hmm. and because of that, you had fans. Because the next crop of cartoonists always comes out of this crop of fans, mm-hmm. so you had a fair number of say female fans that said, "Well, I'd like to do something, but appeals a little bit more to me." And then they take it in a slightly different direction. After two or three generations of that, you get like a whole new like genre of 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 comic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You get you. Uh, so I mean, we did have girls' comics, but they were almost entirely done by guys, and they were you know mostly crappy romance comics. They... Uh, not that romance is automatically crappy, but just the way they handle them usually was kind of like cliched for the most part. They were, and they were done a lot like other... This is one of the reasons why, like, um, uh, for comics, that little Lulu 
Mm -hmm. gets a fair amount of historical attention because that was one of the first ones that was really noteworthy that was done by a female cartoonist. Right. And even then, it's not really that different from any of the other, like, kids' comics of the day. Right. Yeah, that's true. It's a little different, but it doesn't stray too far. No, no, it doesn't. Actually, I'm wrong. It's the end of the 1960s where the Group of 24 actually pop up. Okay. But uh, but still, okay, anyway, we're still, the, the, the point is there, actually, is that this group that, uh, and they're just called that because they were all born roughly around the same time. They're literally not a group. It's just all these female artists um, that popped up around the same time, especially like Ryoko Okeda and, uh, let's see, Toshie Kahara, Ryoko mm-hmm. Yamagishi, but there's another, oh, Yumiko Oshima and Moto Hagio. Moto Hagio is especially important, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, she did a bunch of stuff that was very important at that time. Oddly enough, one person who was um, really noteworthy, um, oh, uh, Ryoko Okeda did a, a one called Rose of Versailles. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, to, she's, which is essentially, in a weird way, it's kind of a retelling of uh, Princess Knight. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of another take on that same kind of story. Princess Knight, by the way, we didn't we didn't describe it, is right. actually a story about um it's kind of a Mulan thing. Set in old front it's set in I think Princess Knight is not set in a real country. Uh Rose of Versailles is. It's set in France during the revolutionary yeah. period. Princess Knight I don't think is. It's just quasi historical. Yeah, it's, but like it's a, about, vaguely European. Yeah, vaguely European. Kinda. But it's about a young female hero who's actually raised to, raised as a boy mm-hmm. and basically becomes it's it's a girl but it's pretending to but she's pretending to be a boy it's the mulan thing basically yeah and uh the same thing is going on in rose of versailles except it's said in revolutionary france mm-hmm. um and uh involve what involves this character who becomes marie antoinette's bodyguard uh, who's who everyone is in love with and thinks is the most beautiful man in france but it, the most beautiful man in france <laughs> is of course actually a woman mm-hmm. um who like has the hots for another guy? Well, surprise. Um, right. But uh, but but is she being ch- constantly chased by women and whatever? Anyway, um, so yeah, there's a whole long history to uh, shoujo and that that we're not going to get into today into the girls' comics stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I guess yeah, as we were saying, it's interesting how they kind of diverge. And this is also the point I should mention how they diverge. Um, the girls' comic stuff will eventually develop, develop a style that's much more um, based on around expressing emotion through comics. Mm-hmm. Um, it's much softer. It's more dreamlike. It's structured more around um, artistic style. I guess you could say it's less... Uh, the lines are very more wavy. It's, less, it's more smooth. It's less solid based on the page. Yeah, that's... But- Thinner lines and more open space. Exactly, yeah. Thinner, and even some of the panels kind of bleed into each other in a more uh, dreamlike way. It's mm-hmm. like I said, it's very expressive, expressionistic, and dreamlike. Basically, I think I think expressionistic. Yeah. I think I can use that term here. Yeah. Um, whereas the boys' stuff, as it continues on, will will shift around, but mostly has very hard lines, very thick panel lines. Um, yeah. Is very like it's very solidly rooted in its time and place yeah. whereas the and is more about conveying the action and the events whereas the girl stuff more and more progressively is about conveying the emotion yeah at least that's how i you know separate the two and i think that's i think that'll work it it is the the uh, shonen stuff is about conveying the emotion but it's usually i'll kill you is the emotion that you're conveying yes there is that and, there, and that's yeah. definitely that yeah <laughs> And that's where the idea, like the uh, the heavy inking and speed lines, comes mm-hmm. from, like the shonen school of comic book thinking. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, there's lots of crossover. I mean, there's a lot of people. Even um, oh, Shitaro, oh, sorry, uh, Shintaro Ishinomori, whose mm-hmm. name will pop up a lot so very shortly, um, what actually worked in girls' comics for, at first for a while. I yeah. mean, they uh, there are a lot of people who were involved in one form or another. Even the boys' comic stuff did girls' comics at one point because there was money in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to be blunt, there was money, and there was uh, it was a chance to do different, like something different. Yeah, uh, one of my all-time favorite comics. It's from the eighties. Was uh, Area Eighty Eight? Yes. And uh, Kyoru Shintani, the guy who did that, he started in girls' comics, and you can tell, like mm-hmm. that's why it it's such an odd comic because you look. 
you've got these like wistful, very fanciful looking character designs. Mm-hmm. Like the main character Shin Kazama has this big giant like ball of of huge like even for the eighties huge hair on his mm-hmm. head, and he's got these like freakishly like gigantic eyes and this thin like physique that it's it's not he doesn't nothing looks solid none of the characters look solid like you said they're Mm. very dreamlike yep but then you've got these super detailed super realistic looking like jet fighters and stuff and yeah it's it's awesome and it and it's a really it's a really weird thing but that again that was where a lot of these guys started developing these new styles especially getting into the 80s because they worked in the girls comics back in like the 60s and 70s yep yep that's very true the closest we had one guy who kind of did that here, mm-hmm. and that was uh, Ernie Cologne. Okay, I'm Ernie, not familiar with his style. You are, you definitely are. If you've ever read a Harvey comic, if you ever seen like a oh. Richie Rich comic, yeah, 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 that had really high draftsmanship. Mm-hmm. That's Ernie that, Cologne. That was him, and he did some stuff like he did a a couple of the the stupid comics website did one where he did these mm-hmm. comics for the like the the teeny bopper girl magazines right and he could t- jump his style back and forth in the 80s he did uh amethyst for dc oh okay and amethyst is basically a japanese style shoujo uh magical girl comic and his style changes a little bit and he gets more of that wistfulness and figurativeness and like you say the emotion as opposed to expressing the action hmm and he's the he's like the the closest we'd ever had here to something like that. Wow, I had no idea that was him. I yeah. should also note, since you mentioned it, that the Japanese magical girl genre, properly the one we know that starts with Sailor Moon, didn't actually exist at this point when he was doing Amethyst. He was kind of doing something along those lines already on his own. Um, I yeah, mean, I... there was some proto stuff that already existed like that, but it probably he wasn't inspired by the Japanese. Is what I'm trying to say. He was doing his own thing. I, it might have been. It, it's it's very like Amethyst was distinct enough. I wouldn't say he's copying the Japanese formula, mm. but there's little tastes of it that if if the folks working on the comic had seen some of the stuff that was going on in Japan towards well, that end, I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, now that you mention it, no, he probably was. I'm probably completely wrong. Okay. I I, of, I often forget about this. Is that in New York? And uh, San Francisco also as well, and Hawaii at this point. In the 1970s, they had Japanese TV channels Mm -hmm. that were showing local stuff. Like they had these international Japanese TV channels that were showing um, Japanese TV shows and anime and such, uh, usually with English subtitles. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, in, yeah, in the New York Metro and, uh, in San Francisco, I, there might've been one in LA. There was definitely one in Hawaii. And I know a lot of people saw them. Like, for example, it's well known that, uh, Chris Claremont was a big fan of the, the creator of the modern X-Men, so to speak, was a big fan of uh, Cyborg 009, mm-hmm. which was airing which predates the modern, you know, the new X-Men with Wolverine and everyone. Um, it predates them. And it's very obvious that it's a huge, we'll say, inspiration that uh, Cyborg yeah. 009 strongly influences the X-Men. And when I say strongly, I'm underselling that. And it does. I mean, it really does. And it's and uh, he, he and a lot of the others were, were involved with some of the local um, fan community that was going on in the New York area, I've read. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were so. And when I say others, I mean the other Marvel artists and DC artists of that period were that were all living around there. They were watching the Japanese stuff. Yeah, maybe not all of them, but definitely some of them. Um, I would imagine even Kirby probably was if he had time. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe maybe not Kirby because yeah. he didn't have time. But actually, no, I wouldn't be surprised if even Kirby was. He probably wasn't as influenced by it, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kirby actually was watching some of that stuff. Who knows? Yeah. I'd be curious to know. Um, maybe if we ever interview someone who actually knew Kirby, we can actually find out. That'd be good. Um, but my point is again is, so probably when I say, you know, Amethyst wasn't it, which came in the eighties, of course, wasn't, wasn't influenced by the Japanese stuff. No, because there would have been some of the early magical girl stuff from the seventies. He probably would have seen, or at least had access to. Yeah. Um, how much of it was influencing him or the writer of the book, maybe the writer of the book. Cause he was just the artist, I believe. Yeah. 
So the, maybe the writer of the book, who I'd have to check who it was, was probably in, being influenced by it. So anyway, but there was probably some influence going on there. There definitely was. This is the point where the Japanese stuff starts influencing the American stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you know, before it was going the other way around, but now the Japanese are way ahead in a lot of ways in terms of comic and animation. They're way ahead of the Americans, partly mm-hmm. because they didn't, the Americans got, you know, kneecapped basically back in the 50s, as we said. Yeah. And now we enter the 70s, the Americans are now uh, being influenced by the Japanese stuff because the Japanese stuff is being imported and everyone's admiring everyone else's stuff at this point. Yeah. Um, I'll, actually, no, wait, we should go back a tiny bit. Um, Because okay. in the 60s, there was actually some import, other important stuff that happened. Uh-huh. Um, in 1969, beginning of the 70s, so we were right on the... This guy named Takao Saito, okay, uh-huh. created a series called <laughs> Google 13. <laughs> um, and yeah, Don's having his laugh because Don is very familiar with Google 13. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about Saito, actually, um, is that he actually created licensed manga versions of the James Bond novels back in the 60s mm-hmm. and even did a manga version of The Man from Uncle. Huh. And so he came into Google 13 having spent several years already basically adapting Western spy stuff. Mm-hmm. And for those who aren't familiar, Google 13 is the world's best assassin. Yeah. And that's kind of an understatement. (laughs) That's kind of an understatement. You know, those of you who are impressed by John Wick, don't be impressed by John Wick. Um, (laughs) You know, Google 13 is kind of the original John Wick. Except Google 13 is what John Wick wishes he was. That's the best way to describe Google 13. I mean, and I'm not saying... That, actually, I'm saying this for someone who actually enjoyed the first John Wick movie. Did, uh-huh. did you see the first John Wick movie, Don? No. Have you seen it? Okay. It's Kenil Reeves beca- being the world's best assassin. That's that's basically what it is. Except he's not in Google 13's league. Not at all. <laughs> um, not in the slightest. Because, of course... Uh, Google 13, yeah, is the best. And his his stories, which are still running till today, as far mm-hmm. as I know... Oh, yeah. Um are yeah they're hardcore kind of spy thrillers basically mostly about either him trying to kill a target that's really tough to kill or in many cases they're sometimes they're told from the police point of view sometimes they're told from the uh, target's point of view sometimes Mm -hmm. they mix it up yeah but yeah there's these stark violent dark uh crime thrillers basically about the world's best professional assassin yeah and whoever hires him to do a job. Yeah. Because there's, there's been a bunch of movies. They just did a, a TV series of it a couple years ago. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. notice that. Uh, animated one, you mean? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think there might have been some live action versions as well. Yeah, there's a bunch of... Uh, there's like three or four live action movies back in like the 60s and 70s. Right. Okay, I can see that. Um, and... Also, before we enter the 70s, uh, I should cover one other small uh, detail. Mm -hmm. Um, In uh, 1968, there was a comic book released called, (laughs) uh, let's see if I can get this right, Haranichi Gakuen, Mm -hmm. uh, or otherwise known as Scandalous School. Yeah. And it was released by um, a guy named Go Nagai. Mm Mm-hmm. No pun intended. Go Nagai was the name of the artist. Go is his pen name. Um, His name is... Kyoichi, I think, is his actual yeah. real name. But, but um, so yeah, Go Nagai um, released it uh, in '68. It's basically a high school sex comedy. It's you know, it's that you know, American Pie, Porky's type yeah. thing, basically. Um, except it was done in manga form in '68, and it, you know, semi. I don't think it was. It wasn't underground, but it wasn't exactly mainstream. Ah, I mean, it was kind. It was it wasn't it? I thought it was like kind of in between. Yeah, see, because now you're getting into the uh, the big thing that happens in the 70s. Right. And so, well, this is 68. Yeah. And so he releases it. It's It became super popular. Teens absolutely loved it because, again, we're, we're at the baby boomers at, uh, at this point, Japanese baby boomers. They're yeah. looking for other stuff that's a little bit edgier and different. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a teen sex comedy. So everyone loves it, basically. You know, mm-hmm. just... Um, I'm not sure what the current one, every decade I've noticed has a, 
uh, teen sex comedy, or at least for the yeah. last couple of decades. And this was Japan's of the nineteen late 1960s, early 1970s. Mm-hmm. Uh, par- people hated it. There were protests in the streets. <laughs> yeah, and, was. You know, it was it was a real like it caused a huge um, uptick in concerned parents. <laughs> let's put it that way. Who were like, "Holy crap! What are you doing to our kids?" Um, yep. <laughs> and going to guy, of course. In Gonagai fashion, would respond by creating a thing called Keko Kamen, um, <laughs> which is which is a superhero story about a costume female costume um, fighter for justice who wears boots, gloves, scarf, and a cowl, and nothing else. Mm-hmm. And this is in some ways considered to be the birth of hentai. In other words, Gonagai is largely credited <laughs> with uh, coming up with uh, yeah pervy comics, basically. Um, you're, the best you're, way, you know, you're, you're calling Keiko Kamen a pervy comic? It's the beginning of them. Just just because her finishing move involves smothering you to death with her crotch? Yeah, oh yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that, that's kind of it. <laughs> Quick, hit the sarcasm yeah. button. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, so that's definitely, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pervy <laughs> comic. So, mm-hmm. as you can see, at this point, in the late 60s, sex and violence arrive into the Japanese uh, manga world. Mm-hmm. Like, really, sex and violence have arrived. <laughs> and, thus we enter, and thus we enter the 1970s. I think we can safely enter them now, can't we? Yeah, we can. As safe okay. as possible. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, okay. I, 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 you, some people, you might want to wear protection because we're going in. <laughs> And the seventies are going to be uh, the seventies are going to be um, pretty interesting. Yeah, because that was that 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 gets into a really really um, I guess formative time in for for Japanese comics. Yes, it is. One of the things that you had happening in the sixties that leads into this is um, here in the eighties in North America. One of the things that gave us a chance to experiment was we had the establishment of the comic shop, mm-hmm. and they when they started in the late seventies, early eighties here, they catered to kind of an older audience. Um, the kind of folks that they like comics, but kind of outgrew what was on the stand. So they're looking for something different. And that's where you got like your alternatives. Mm-hmm. Um, the seventies here, we had the undergrounds. Right. That kind of starts in the 62. The Japanese sort of did the same thing mm-hmm. with um, the comic rental places. Mm hmm. What was happening as you had a mainstream industry, because again, starting in the fifties, people could buy their own comics. Right. By the sixties, they were the 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 weeklies were like cheap disposable entertainment. Mm-hmm. So they proliferated. There was just loads of these things. The comic the the comic rental places were still around, and they sort of became the home to more experimental stuff. Hmm. Like the more artsy stuff. Um the more over the top stuff, because the idea was it's, it's kind of like cable did for television. You're paying right. for it. You have to actively search it out. Mm-hmm. The kind of people who would do that aren't interested in the mainstream stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're probably not interested because they're older. Right. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. That, that scene scene didn't last too long. By the end of the sixties, it kind of dies out. Um, But you've seen, into mainstream comics, you start to see again going to guy the the, mm-hmm. the the one man wrecking crew of the comic industry. You, you start to see kind of the more mature themes in that, and I think it's it's the same thing that happened here with our mainstream comics in the eighties that they saw. Well, there is an audience for this kind of thing. There's an audience looking for something a little heavier, a little different, so we can push things that way. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you mentioned Gogo Thirteen. The Gogo Thirteen stories—they're—they're they're not kid stuff at all. No, um, no, they're not. Well, I mean, they include the requisite amount of sex and violence, and lots, and then they throw some more violence in for good measure. Um, yeah, well, because <laughs> Gogo Thirteen—because if you've ever seen one, a Gogo Thirteen sex scene is pretty memorable. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they were, yeah. Uh, the and uh, just to explain. A Google Thirteen sex scene consists of a woman um, in you know the throes of ecstasy, while Google Thirteen lays there or sits there with a stone face, just kind of staring ahead, emotionless, while this woman has sex with him. Yeah, he never shows emotion. At he all. never shows emotion even during sex. So it, it's kind of funny in its own way. It really is, and then because remember, too, out of that era, you also got like uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Which um, was... Well, that comes in 1970. Uh, 67. Yes. 67? Yep, that was when it started. But it ran for like a million years. No, I have... Uh, I'm looking at my comics chronology here, and it says September 1970 to April 76. Okay, because I had it starts in uh, Weekly Manga Action in 67. Okay. Well, we have a dispute here, folks. Okay. All right, let's 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 go to the. Uh, let's, <laughs> uh, where did you get yours? Get my what? Okay, so Lone Wolf and Cub. Okay, so let's let's double check here. First published in 1970. I've got that. No, I've got multiple credits here for 1970 to 76. Okay, well we'll go with that then. Yep, I've got I've got multiple credit returns. So yeah, um, but again, around that period, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a it's a product. But so yeah, it's because there's a samurai boom going on around that period. Yeah. Because it's, again, it's that idea of the more dramatic, the more serious stories. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is, of course, this is the point where we start getting the Gekiga merging with the Shonen. And in a lot of ways, actually, I would say Lone Wolf and Cub is basically a Gekiga story. I, w- I would argue that it's yeah. more Gekiga than it is Shonen or anything else. Because it's targeted towards a mature audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, for those of you who haven't seen Lone Wolf and Cub, it's basically about a former samurai wandering ancient Japan with his son and encountering all sorts of like weird uh, villains and situations and stuff. And uh, but it's not played for silliness at all. It's super serious, yeah. like super super serious and very well told. So it's, it's a work of art. It really is. It's like it's a probably one of the best samurai stories ever done in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's still revered today, both in America and in uh, Japan as well. And of course, there are there's a two TV series, mm-hmm. and there's a uh, there was of course the the movies that came out. Yeah, what were they called? Baby Cart Across the River. What the Baby Cart Saga? The I think Baby it's Cart called. Assassin. Uh, Shogun's is it Shogun's Assassin or something like that? Yeah, Shogun's Assassin was the uh, the English version. Yeah, and it's like two of them squished together. Kazuo Koike and Goseki Kojima created it, and it's it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Like if if you if there are ten manga you were to read, Lone Wolf and Cub is one of the top ten. Yeah. Like if you're only ever to read ten, it's one of the absolute top ten. Yeah, it's there's twenty eight volumes to it. It's supposedly sold at least eight million copies. I don't know if that includes the American release, but it doesn't matter anyway. It is just mm. truly a work of art. It yeah. really is. So we hit the 1970s. Yep. We're actually finally in the actual 70s. Oh my God. Um, it's the age <laughs> of Aquarius. All that stuff's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, Japan is choking under its own smog at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because they're they're just starting to discover who knew pollution is bad for people. And remember, all their factories are in one place. Well, they're mostly in Yokohama. They're, they're not in Tokyo proper. A lot of right. their factories are in Yokohama because that's Tokyo's sister city which is basically where they stuck all the industry yeah but they're still kind of the same general area well nowadays they are they're literally yeah. considered the greater tokyo yokohama area they're literally considered one giant mega city mm-hmm. um but in this in this point they're just next to each other they're both kind of around the bay from each other mm. um anyway neither neither here nor that <laughs> all right so um and then in 1972 mm-hmm. this thing happens um <laughs> Which in October 1972, in weekly Shonen Jump, mm-hmm. which is at this point, is a boys comic magazine. When did Shonen Jump actually debut? I don't actually have a note for that. 68. 68. Okay, we should have mentioned that. Okay, we apologize. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. Shonen Jump is basically Japan's equivalent to Marvel Comics. Okay, except it's imagine if all the different Marvel comics like Spider-Man, Iron Man, all that stuff was published in one giant weekly anthology. Mm -hmm. Okay, imagine that. Okay, so instead of buying all these individual issues, you just buy that one like phone book of a thing once a week and it has printed on super cheap paper in cheap ink. You've got the adventures of all your favorite superheroes and interesting characters and Marvel stories. That Imagine that. Okay, that is shown in Jump. And it holds the same place in Japanese culture as Marvel Comics does in American culture. That's probably the best way of putting it. I mean, you could say DC, but I would go with Marvel. I would actually say Marvel is probably the better equivalent. Yeah, at this time, they're probably closer to DC because they were like number two. Okay. But they kind of quickly become number one. because They kind of quickly, yep. Their, uh, Kodansha used to be like the, the biggest publisher of comics. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, Shonen Jump was owned by uh, the the Hitotsubashi Group, Mm -hmm. which is kind of three different companies. Right. And they said, let's do comics. Let's just fucking do comics. And then they did. And by the 70s, I believe, it it, it, uh, surpassed everybody else. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, it yeah, it did. <laughs> There's no question on that. Yeah, because up uh, until then, it used to mm-hmm. be a weekly shonen. Mm-hmm. Was the uh, the big was the big uh, comic book that came right, out. and that was Kodansha. Yep, Kodansha, and then um, Weekly Shonen Jump mm-hmm. uh, in October 1972. In Weekly Shonen Jump, a uh, strip called. Uh, Messenger Z or Z, uh-huh. depending on whether you're Canadian or American, <laughs> appears by Go Nagai, who we mentioned earlier. You know, the guy who was buying Shameless School and everything else. Yep. And this was the very first giant robot uh, man- manga story thingy, like ever. Like yeah. this, this is basically this is the first giant robot hero. This is the beginning of what we call what they're sometimes called the super robot era yep. of uh, where. You know, we've got a character who Koji Kabuto. It's Koji Kabuto, right? Yep. Because yeah, Kabuto got, means helmet. <laughs> exactly. So we got Koji Kabuto. Well, his father dies. His uncle becomes the head of the Photonic Institute, and he gets the he gets gets control of Messenger Z, which he uses to fight Doctor Hell mm-hmm. and uh, his monster army, which are basically threatening to like destroy Japan. Yeah. And this comes out, and it blows everyone's minds. Yep. Like. That's an understatement. <laughs> it super blows everyone's minds. Like, they're all like, holy shit, this is the most awesome thing ever. And mm-hmm. it ends up being very quickly uh, animated. Yep. Very quickly after that, because animation was already a thing, and anything that becomes popular gets animated. And this basically set Gona Guy up for life. Yeah, Not but... that he needed to, he would do a bunch of other stuff <laughs> later, but... Yeah, well, there's there's a couple things that kind of lead into that. Mm-hmm. Go. Um... You mentioned the uh, Shameless School. Yep. Which Gonagai did. And that's kind of comes out of that idea. Like we said, you had the uh, the Gekiga. Mm-hmm. So you had these heavy, serious stories. And Gonagai just kind of basically said, well, how about if I do that level of disturbingness, but make it a comedy? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where you get Shameless School. Shameless School was incredibly popular. It, but the thing was, Gonagai didn't make any royalties off of it. Oh, really? And he, that was why he created Dynamic Productions, which was his his studio that did the uh, comics and did the animation. That would make sense because um, they were, yeah, because at that point, they were all work for hire. You basically just handed over your story each week or whatever to the publisher, and they owned it basically after that, and they did what they wanted with it. Yep, and usually what had happened was, uh, again, going way back to the 50s, if you were a cartoonist, you had a studio or you were part of a studio mm-hmm. and your studio would produce your work and then they'd ship it off to whoever would publish it. And that was why, like you said earlier on, you would have the same cartoonist appearing in magazine, like eight different magazines. Right. Because that makes they, sense. and it was, it, we had something similar in the nineties mm. when, when like uh image made all the money and then everybody wanted to be image. So they all started their own studio. But when the collapse happened, their studios would start licensing out. So, mm-hmm. so like say it was uh, Jim Lee was Wildstorm Studios, right? Yeah, and it would be Image Comics and Wildstorm Studios presents whatever. And then when they did like the animated Wildcats, part of that's attributed to Wildstorm because that was Jim Lee's studio, right? And I think they're still using that system today, aren't they? I mean, I th- isn't it that uh, there's a whole bunch of these studios and then uh, mostly IDW. Because uh-huh. image got bought by image got bought by DC, yeah. So uh, I think it's IDW exists pretty much just to publish these smaller studios at this point. You do get that some of them will work for like Marvel and DC, but I don't think they work as their studio. It's just that like Bob Cartoonist will have like you know Bobcom, and Bobcom will produce books A, B, and C. IDW mm. will publish them, but Bob cartoonist will also work for marvel but as bob cartoonist not part of the bob co studio okay i could see that whereas yeah japan they always kind of had that and then when the animation took off a lot of the guys started the bigger ones started their own animation companies Mm, and that was and that was going to guy and that was 
I do believe that Dynamic are the ones that did Mazinger Z. Right. They did it. Yes. Yeah, they were, of course. Yeah, they were. They were under, they were under kind of license because uh, what happens a lot for the Japanese stuff, and if you've ever seen a Japanese show rate right from Japan after the end credits, there's always a, we'd like to thank our sponsors little segment. Hmm. Um, a lot of times the co- companies that were doing the animation would license out to the uh, the TV networks. Mm-hmm. And they're basically, it's it's what would be considered a co-production. Right. But it's just the network kind of picking up the tab. But because of that, they do get some input and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Because that leads to one of the other things that kind of happens through Gona Guy. Mm-hmm. Gona Guy invents the Messenger Z, the idea of a robot that you drive like a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And he's also the guy that added gratuitous sex and violence to Japanese comic books and, and cartoons. Yes. And it happens sort of accidentally. Mm-hmm. And um, as I understand it, there was one of the networks wanted to do like an hour long uh, animated action anthology like series for girls. Mm-hmm. And they went to go on a guy and they said, we want you to do a segment. And that was where Cutie Honey comes from. Right. That makes sense. But what happened was halfway through the production, the, the, the network said, no, nope, it's going to be for boys now. And they said, well, what do we do? We've already like per- made like half of this show. How do we-, we can't just change it? And they're like, no, 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 no. You're under contract. We need a boys show. So in desperation, they said, well, how do we make like this magical girl show like a boys show? And they said, well, gratuitous sex and violence. Right. And that's where they reshot the scene when she transforms. She's actually naked. Yep. And then they just add some more like crazy monster villains and weird fight scenes. And then that took off. And the funny thing is it was popular with like males and females. Well, yes, I can see that. And because of that popularity into the future that I I, I have no doubt that is like where all of the gratuitous sex and violence comes from. Because he was already putting that in with his comics. His comics were like these crazy, dark, over the top, horrifying things. Oh yeah, fan service. It's that's where it comes from. Well, and some fan disservice because there was a lot of stuff. Is like ew, ah, uh, ick, no, ew, yeah, ew, yikes, yeah. ew, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Okay, you got me there. That's true. <laughs> but that was oh boy. It yeah. came. Yeah. It came. It came from that, and then I think it's a mm-hmm. chicken and egg thing. But what happened in the seventies in Japan was reading comics became sort of an act of rebellion. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, because it was still seen as, as if not ki- strictly kid stuff, it's accessibility in that, kind of like here, it was seen as mm-hmm. kind of lowbrow stuff. Right. And uh, once you had, like, going to guy show up, it was disturbing and it was offensive and the powers that be were like, this is terrible, you shouldn't watch this. So, of course, all the young folks are like, I'm going to watch it because well, you yeah, said I shouldn't. <laughs> it's the it's the heavy metal. You know, they, yeah. naturally, as soon as, as soon as you tell kids they can't have something, you have just sold a million of them. That's exa- And that's kind of what happens in the 70s. And then you start getting these these ideas that were in the back burner earlier, like the, uh, the, the uh, Gekiga stuff. Mm -hmm. the Asenen stuff, it starts moving into the foreground. Yeah. Because, again, the people who are really getting into the comics are the guys that they want something that's going to, like, offend and disturb people. Mm -hmm. Like, that's part of the kick. It's it's like our underground comic scene during the same era. Yeah. Now, we should note something, uh, of Mm -hmm. course, which is that at this point, there are a ton of publishers. Yeah. Like, there are a couple of big ones, but there are a ton of small publishers. Um, remember, this is we're still talking pre-internet here. We're still talking... I mean, they have TV, of course. They Just like we do. They have movies and television, etc. But they have a ton of publishers. So they are competing for eyeballs with a great many people. Yeah. And so, to be blunt, sex and violence sell. And they yep. do. Um, and, and, you know, and so they're... And there are publishers of all levels, from uh, all levels, all different styles, everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you it's natural for you to go want to do some slightly extreme stuff just to get attention at this point. And I think that some of this was just going to a guy who was just a savvy marketer. Yeah. And he basically looked at it and said, yeah, I mean, you know, this, uh, how can they make this sell? Okay, tits. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. But that's, you know, that's what works. TNA. And, 
And the nice part of that, too, is there's no oversight, no comics code. Well, yes and no. Because remember, after uh, Shameless School and such, the PTAs started to actually get active. The parent-teacher associations started to get active and rally against him and saying, that no, this stuff is rotting kids' minds. Yeah, mostly him specifically. <laughs> mostly going to guys specifically. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. the man is my hero, I have to say. Yeah, if the audience hadn't guessed that by now, he... <laughs> He's but, not. He's not exaggerating, folks. He really is like Gona Guy. Is you know Don yeah. worships Gona Guy. He, there's. I'm surprised there's not a giant altar to Gona Guy in your house. Oh, you, you haven't seen my house lately, anyway. Oh, okay. Saying. Well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I believe that. Okay, yeah. he may have an altar there, folks, and he may not be joking. <laughs> but the um, thing, the thing with mm -hmm. that, the PTA did. But mm -hmm. what ended up happening, where I think, um, again, we never did it here, was. At this point, because this is going to come up way later on, mm. they didn't get much traction. And it was because what would happen is they'd say, this is rotting kids' minds. And then the exec would say, but it's selling 8 million copies a week. It's where it's at, you know. Yep. Oh, there goes our G rating for this episode. But yeah, yep. <laughs> um, yep. No, no, no. That's that's exactly it. And of course, this is also why you get the rise of the of the adult comic book industry starts yeah. here during the 70s, where some people literally say, you know, why don't we just make stuff about sex? OK. Mm -hmm. And they and they they start literally an industry that's publishing porn comics. Um, and I remember back in the 90s when I was living in Japan for a while there, I remember you could go down. You'd go down to the local bookstore and yeah, I mean, there'd be Shonen Jump and then literally just a few feet away would be like these piles of porn comics. Mm -hmm. Now, I presume if you're under a certain age, they're probably not going to sell them to you. Yeah. But then again, you can get comics in, in vending machines too and vending machines don't check ID. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, I actually once asked one of my uh, male Japanese friends, it's like, what age do you start reading this stuff? And he said, oh, about 12. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm talking post-internet, but before the internet becomes a big thing in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. For various reasons, it took a lot longer to get in. It's ironic, but Japan took forever to get its internet off the ground. Mm -hmm. Short version is basically because in Japan, even telephone calls, they might not be anymore, but it used to be that you have to, you have to pay by the minute. Mm -hmm. And internet access back in the early days was pretty much entirely phone only. So not mm -hmm. only would you have to pay for the all your equipment and you'd have to pay for your internet service provider. You'd also have to be paying like a couple yen, a, you know, a couple, what, 10 cents a minute, basically to right. actually use it, which, okay, not too bad. Right. Think about that for a minute and think about how fast that adds up, especially if you want to spend much time online. Um, and this, so this, this horribly retarded the Japanese, um, internet industry um to and prevented it from growing and developing until literally until like the well into the 2000s hmm. um it was it was actually a huge mistake on their part meanwhile over in korea they were basically giving everyone like uh fiber optic like left <laughs> right and center and like making it as cheap as possible because they saw it was going to be the future right so end result the koreans when it came to internet stuff are way ahead of the japanese huh. um because the, the japanese just did not take to the internet very well at first. They 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 have since. I mean, they totally have since. But right. it took a, it took forever. Anyway, complete side note. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> back in time. Rewind. Okay. So we're we're still back in the seventies. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Gona guy is doing his thing, and um, and so he he creates multiple industries, including the Japanese porn comics industry, <laughs> basically by himself, mm -hmm. kind of by accident. Um, he's like kind the, of on he's, purpose. He's the evil Osamu Tezuka. He pretty much is. <laughs> he pretty much is. I'd be curious to know what his connection with Tezuka actually is. I because remember a lot of these guys, especially of this period, if they're not directly connected to, they're usually directly or indirectly connected to one of Tezuka's uh, students, basically. Yeah. Because Tezuka had a whole ton of like students and assistants he basically worked with, and yeah. then they went on and they had their own studios and assistants, and it kind of bloomed out from there. And I think Gona Guy is, I think, might be third generation from Tezuka. I'm not sure. Second yeah. or third generation. I think he, yeah, because he was uh, one of uh, Ishinomori's apprentices. Right. And Ishinomori was one of Tezuka's uh, contemporaries. Yeah. I don't know if, if uh, Ishinomori, who we actually skipped, because I think Ishinomori was actually from the uh, 60s, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and I think I should, Cyborg 009 should be mentioned mm -hmm. um, because it appeared 
because it started yeah. in 64. It started yeah. in 64. We accidentally skipped over Cyborg 009. Cyborg 009 is basically Japan's first superhero team. They are literally, they're the X-Men. Mm-hmm. Except they post-date Stan Lee's X-Men, which was 1963, I think was the original X-Men. 63 but, or 64. Yeah, cause right. the, and, but then again, they probably I can pretty much guarantee that um, Ishinomori did not actually read uh, Stan Lee's Marvel Comics. I'm pretty yeah. sure, I can think we can safely say he created it separately. Yeah, because um, uh, it wasn't until, geez, like the late 90s, early 2000s, that the uh, the Japanese started reading American comics at all. Oh, they were kind of. I mean, there was some. I mean, even back in the nineties when I was there, they had they had American comics, but they're reading they're reading collections of them basically. Yeah, and um, it, it, it wasn't a big thing. It no, but it wasn't a big thing. They them commonly don't read Japanese American comics. They actually don't. Because in fact, I, I would argue most of their exposure to American superheroes comes from movies and cartoons. Yeah, because that was a thing in the seventies too. They uh, Marvel did a uh, an exchange, I guess you call it, with Japan because mm, they, they wanted did. they wanted to move into the Japanese market because they're like you've got this huge comic market. But what they had to do is they had to kind of like I guess manga up their characters. Yep, and that was where you got like the 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 oh my god the Marvel Japan Hulk <laughs> where yep. He's this giant emo monster that starts crying at a moment's notice. Yep. That and would be him. An in, infamous Japanese Spider-Man. Yeah. Yep. With his giant robot. Uh-huh. <laughs> but again, it, it was, it was again, I can, it's the idea that the attitudes yep. are very different. Mm-hmm. Um, the styles are very different. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of like the Japanese comics history starting right from like pre-war going well into the nineties, they're always expanding. They're always doing something new. There was like, um, like we've been mm-hmm. saying here every decade, basically some new formula got added to what was considered mainstream comic. Yep. Whereas here we used, we, we'd have contractions. Mm-hmm. And I think that was why you, you, it, unless you hit certain eras, American stuff didn't have, that kind of vibrancy so the rest of the world didn't really care so much i mean they did know i mean for example there was that uh batman bat manga no. <laughs> superhero thing that appeared in 1966 yeah um, which which is pretty freaking insane um <laughs> and that bizarre localization of batman that you can actually buy there's a translation of it kicking around in bookstores i recommend um, it. and and yeah, there's a, a Japanese Spider-Man, there's a Japanese Hulk, mm. and they're mostly in the, like, around the 19th, well, the Batmanga was in 66. Yeah. Um, actually, interesting note, you know who did the uh, Batmanga? Oh, shoot, I did, but it just left. The creator of 8-Man. Oh, yeah. Jiro Kuwada, uh, who created 8-Man. Once 8-Man ended, he actually, in 66, and then he took on doing the Batmanga. He's the guy who did the the Japanese version of Batman. Okay, that makes sense because Eight Man had all kinds of weird, messed up bad guys too. Yep. So, so there were fans. I mean, they knew about the American stuff. And remember, they were because the American GIs were based in Japan post war. Uh-huh. America still has military bases in Japan, although they're pretty much limited to Okinawa now. Yeah. At one time, they had bases all over Japan, and so these GIs were getting in American comics, mm-hmm. and the Japanese were getting a hold of them. And so what was happening, they weren't common. I think there was probably just this small, relatively small um, fandom that I think existed for American comics in yeah. Japan. Yeah, there was because remember, uh, Antarctic collected a bunch of them when they did their uh, that special volume of Justice. Right. That there was, there was, there's, there's always kind of been fans of American comics in Japan, but mm-hmm. they're typically closer to like what we would think of as like alternative comic fans. Yes, yeah. They're not it's not mainstream, not by any means. Yeah. Like I would argue it's probably not mainstream today either. No. No, which is is kind of interesting cuz the Japanese love European comics. Yes, they do. But British and American not so much. I think I I can see why though. The European comics have a sophistication to them that generally speaking the Americans and British ones don't. Yeah, there's that and they they tended to, especially getting into the uh, 60s and the 70s. Mm-hmm. 
uh, they tended to be, the European comics were a lot more experimental than ours mm. were. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you were want to learn new artistic styles and different approaches in that, what are you going to read? You know, Marvel Comics or Heavy Metal? Yeah. Anyway, but I just wanted to bring that up because Cyborg 009 is actually quite important. We've mentioned Ishinomori's name is going to pop up. Uh, may, might pop up again later on. Yeah. Um, there's another guy who's really important in the 70s. His name is Lijai Matsumoto or Reiji Matsumoto, depending okay. on how you want to read it. Um, he is the creator of uh, a small thing called Space Cruiser Yamato. Mm-hmm. Uh, also known, and he's also the creator of Captain Harlock. Uh, Galaxy Express 999 and a bunch of other like major sci-fi ones of the 1970s. Yeah. The 1970s saw a major sci-fi boom as well happen. Yeah. And the Japanese comics of course reflect whatever the pop culture boom is going on and so the the Japanese were doing the sci-fi thing. Now here's the interesting note. The Japanese thing were doing the sci-fi thing at the beginning of the 1970s. Yeah. Now while there was an American sci-fi boom going on in the 1970s, it didn't true I would say it didn't go nuts until about 77 with the release of Star Wars. Right. Whereas the Japanese were doing it way before then. Uh, Yamato, I think, is 72. It's like 72 or 73. Uh, I think Yamato is a little later, but Harlock was in that era. Um. Okay, let's see. Because what ends up happening, I've seen this before, is in the early 70s in Japan... Mm-hmm. There's a sudden boom in 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 the old pulps, like the old like American pulps. Yeah, they were reading all the American pulps. Yep, that's and, exactly right. And part of the sci-fi boom was because they're reading all of these old classic science fiction, and that's why this like pulp swashbuckling science fiction kind of stuff takes off. And then mm-hmm. when Star Wars hits Japan, they're already primed for it because they've had a few years of this sort of thing. And then that's kind of like the ultimate realization of what science fiction should be. Yep. Okay, makes sense. Um, Actually, Yamato was 74. Okay. Yeah, Yamato was 74. Um, He's... He'd done done stuff before. He'd done been doing stuff back into the 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matsumoto was born when... He was born in 38. So, uh, like, wait, is that right? 38, yeah. 1938. So, yeah, he's, he's an older fellow. Um, and yeah, he'd been doing stuff for a while, but Yamato will be 74 and then, no, wait, I, now I wonder if that's the anime or the comic. Uh, anyway, regardless, get, we're getting distracted, but anyway, uh-huh. so yeah, we've got this huge sci- sci-fi boom going on in the 19, um, especially early 1970s. Yeah. Um, so they, there'd kind of been a little bit of a superhero boom and stuff going on in the sixties and the seventies. We get, we get the sci-fi boom. Um, and that's So that's going on. What else? What else is going on in the 70s? Don, tell me. So we've got Gona Guy, we've got Matsumoto, um, we've got Super Robots. So everybody and their brother, including Matsumoto, is doing a Super Robot show because that yeah. becomes the most popular thing ever. Yeah, and that's that kind of combines your superhero and your uh, science fiction. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Is the su- And when we say Super Robot, just to clear it up, those are ones, um, I think, say like Voltron, mm-hmm. that they didn't really attempt to uh, ascribe to any kind of laws of physics Mm. there wasn't any sense of realism it was like here's the giant robot it usually has like its special super attack it can only use once at the end of the episode kind of thing and Mm -hmm. and then the bad guy throws wave after wave of like evil boogly monsters at him which they kind of explain in mazinger right and again, it, it it ties in with what we used to say. We said about the slasher flicks that somebody does something that makes sense, but then mm-hmm. it becomes a trope, and people forget why. Right. Because what was happening is Doctor Hell had actually found this mm-hmm. ancient city that had all the uh, ancient evil, like giant robot monsters in it. So he didn't make them. No, he 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 was reviving them, and that's why you very they you because you always ask why don't you just send fifty out to go stomp on Mazinger's ass? Well, because he didn't have them. Mm, okay, he was, makes sense. He was awakening, but there are episodes where he would send like three or four of them out, right? And that was kind of—I don't know if they specifically stated it, but it was implied that he could only get so many of them working at a time because it, it took effort to reactivate them. Oh, okay, makes sense. But then that became the trope. So every super robot show, every episode, a new evil villain thing would show up, and you're like, "Well, just don't send one this week. Tomorrow, send two. You know, like. And they right, never, yeah. 
They never they do. They never do. Well, they kind of do. I think I think probably in I'm assuming in like the climax or that kind of thing, they probably does send two or three monsters at the same time and that's how they finally defeat Mazinger. After like 50 episodes or 100 episodes. Mhm. Um I'd have to check. I don't know if that's actually correct, but uh that sounds relatively correct to me. Anyway. Yeah. Or close anyway. Okay. So um but this, so yeah, what else happens in the seventies that's important? Oh, there's so much, but I think okay. um, mm-hmm. I I think for <laughs> for brevity's sake and to not completely overwhelm because the seventies are a big experimental time, mm-hmm. definitely. And this idea, like you said, of the superhero and the the science fiction, the technology, that kind of leads directly into the major beats of the eighties. Okay, and I think that's an excellent spot to leave it. All right, folks, please uh, come back in two weeks when we'll be covering the 80s until the modern era of manga. Uh, We didn't want to overwhelm you with too much, so that's why we split this story into two parts. And quite the story it is. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at ObeyTheDNA.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya! over and join the conversation at obeythedna.com where you will find show notes and more.